Chair Russell, we are live. We can start the meeting on your call. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Budget Committee meeting for February uh, 2nd, 2022. It is 9.32 in the morning. Um, my name is Paul Russell. I represent Lower Sackville. Uh, I'd like to uh, first off by acknowledging that uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. As uh, we do with uh, these virtual meetings, I'd like to go around the table and just make sure that everybody's uh, audio video is uh, set up and, and functioning properly. So let's start with uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, District 1. Good morning. Ah, there we go. Couldn't seem to come off mute. Good morning, Mr. Chair, colleagues and staff. Good morning, and Councillor Hensby, District 2. Uh, good morning from uh, Preston, Chesapeake, Eastern Shore. Uh, for our Asian community, a happy Lunar New Year, the Year of the Tiger. Let's go Cincinnati Bengals, so hopefully they'll take the Super Bowl. Anyway, also as African Heritage Month, I'm wearing my Kente cloth, and we also need to recognize that the African Nova Scotia culture and community has been hitting Nova Scotia over 400 years, and we want to take the opportunity this month to acknowledge and also to participate in any of the, the civic events they may have online with another COVID uh, year. So make sure you participate online with any many events that are available across the province. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hensby, for those uh, important announcements. Um, Councillor Kent, District 3, good morning. Councillor Kent might not be able to join us uh, immediately. And Councillor Purdy, District 4, good morning. Good morning, representing good morning. District 4, happy to be here. Good stuff, thank you. Councillor Austin, District 5, good morning. I uh, here, Mr. Chair, ready to go. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mancini, District 6, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, good morning, everybody. All, all set to go, let's go. Good stuff. Uh, Councillor Mason, District 7. Good morning. Happy to be here, Mr. Chair. Let's get it going. Absolutely. Uh, Councillor Smith, District 8. Good morning. Hey, Chair and colleagues. Good to see you all. I had no power this morning, so if I if I drop out, um, it might be because I lost power again. So if I'm not here, I'll try to join in again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we should also have power at City Hall. Um, Councillor Cleary, District 9. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Russell, colleagues, residents. Happy to be here, ready to go. Good stuff. Good morning, Councillor Morse, District 10. Good morning, all from Clayton Park. Happy February. Happy February, indeed. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, District 11, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Let's, uh, let's get going. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stoddard, District 12, good morning. Good morning to the staff and colleagues. And I thank you for uh, Councillor Hensby acknowledging Black History Month. And I'd like to start Black History Month with a flag of Jamaica in my rear. Thank you. In the background. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. And Deputy Mayor Lovelace, District 13, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here representing Hammonds Plains, uh, St. Margaret's on this uh, chilly day. It certainly is. Uh, and uh, Councillor Blackburn, District 14, good morning. Hello, good morning, everybody. Coming to you live from uh, beautiful downtown Beaver Bank, pencil sharpened and ready to go. Good stuff, thank you. And Councillor Outfit, uh, District 16, good morning. Good morning to all from Bedford Wentworth and Lindell's got to remember to pay his power bill. We'll send him a reminder. That's right, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Happy to be here. Good stuff. Thank you. And let's wrap back around to uh, Councillor Kent from District 3. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. So everybody is here uh, from Council. Um, we have the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes and there are no minutes uh, from the uh, previous meeting. Approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Um, over to the clerk.
Good morning. There are no additions or deletions for the agenda for today's meeting. I will note that there has been a request to do with item seven before item number six. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, is there anybody from uh, uh, council who would, uh, well, I guess we need the motion on the floor first. Can I have a motion to approve the order of business and approval of so additions moved, and deletions? Mr. Chair. I can thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, was, we was, there a, had... was there a request to put item number seven ahead of dot number six? Absolutely. Yep. I uh, just... move the adjustment of the order. Okay. Thank you. Second. Uh, so, thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Are there any other changes to the order of business? Okay. All in favor of the amended order of business, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, we have an agenda. Uh, call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Seeing none, uh, the next item on the agenda is public participation. As a reminder to those watching from home, in order to have signed up as a speaker, the deadline was 4.30 p.m. on the business day prior to the hearing. Um, and this applies for both the Wednesday and the Friday hearings. We currently have two speakers signed up for today's meeting. Any member of the public who has registered with the clerk's office on this matter will be given five minutes to address the topic. When I call your name, you may unmute and begin speaking. The speakers today are Seo Gadet and Victoria Levac. Uh, Seo, are you in the meeting with us? And am I pronouncing your first name correctly? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And you're uh, pronouncing it correctly. Thank you. Not a problem. Uh, go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Seo Gaudet. I live in Dartmouth, and I'm an economist and policy analyst with 32 years experience in policy development and implementation, including in the areas of environmental and tax policy. I'd like to congratulate you and city staff on the Halifax plan. Uh, Halifax is a timely and ambitious plan to help meet one of the defining public policy challenges of our time. I strongly support it. I'm here today to talk about financing Halifax, specifically the proposal for a 3% property tax surtax. I want to state at the outset that I'm not here to oppose the tax, but instead to present an alternative financing mechanism that by the end of my talk, I hope you will agree is worth exploring. The 3% tax will raise approximately $17 million per year. What if there were another way to raise this 17 million? And what if that alternative was much more closely related to the goals and purposes of Halifax than the proposed property tax surtax? It turns out that if my calculations are correct, the per liter gasoline charge of just 2.0 cents per liter levied in HRM alone would do the job. So why tax gasoline to fund a climate change program? There are three key reasons. Number one, carbon is the thing we want to reduce, so it makes sense to tax it. Number two, it makes sense to use the proceeds of a carbon tax to finance a climate change program. They work together to the same purpose. Number three, the tax can be avoided by driving less, combining trips, buying a more efficient vehicle, all things that a climate change program should be looking to encourage. Why not tax housing to fund a climate change program? Well, we want more housing, not less. We should avoid taxing it if there are better alternatives. Number two, there is no strong argument that can be made for financing a climate change program through property taxes other than a lack of feasible alternatives. Number three, there is nothing homeowners can do to reduce the tax by reducing their carbon footprint. Indeed, to the extent that improving insulation and replacing the heating system would raise the value of an older home, that investment would be taxed. Of course, HRM does not have the authority to charge gasoline tax. This would require some form of agreement with the province. Importantly, the mechanism for collecting a gasoline tax in HRM already exists in the form of the provincial per liter gasoline tax that operates in our HRM as it does in other all, parts, uh, all other parts of the province. In the simplest model, all that would need to be done is for the province to charge an extra 2.4 cents per liter to HRM customers and transfer those funds to HRM. HRM could pay an administrative fee to the province in exchange for this service. That's only one model. There are likely many more possibilities. 
Now, the idea of residents, specific municipalities, paying higher gas taxes than in the rest of the province is not new in Canada. For example, in British Columbia, drivers in Victoria pay 5.5 cents more than drivers in the rest of the province, except in Vancouver, where they pay a full 12.5 cents more. This makes the idea of an extra 2.4 cents in HRM seem quite reasonable. But if 2.4 cents seems too high, it could conceivably be only one cent. This would still raise around 7 million, reducing the burden on homeowners and allowing for a smaller surtax or somewhere in between. What am I asking you to do? Now it's too late to reconsider the financing plan for Halifax this year, including of course, 3% surtax. That would slow down or could even shut down progress in an area, in an area that actually needs to be accelerated. I would like your support for what I hope will be Councillor Austin's request to staff that they investigate the revenue potential and feasibility of a small gasoline tax to be levied within HRM only to provide all or a portion of the 17 million seed financing for Halifax. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, higher tar carbon taxes are coming. They are a necessary part of what the world needs to do to slow the rate of climate change. As a climate change mitigation and adaptation program, Halifax seems ideally positioned to take advantage of the financing opportunities that the revenues from those carbon taxes will create. It is a possibility that deserves to be explored. Thank you for so, your time. Thank you very much uh, for your, uh, your presentation. I was just going to remind you that you had 30 seconds left. Um, are there any questions of clarification on uh, what, uh, what SEO has presented? I don't see anything from, uh, from council. So thank you again, Seo. That is uh, certainly a discussion we can uh, continue with, uh, with the province. And let me go back to my notes. Um, Vicki Leback, good morning. Are you with us this morning? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, you have five minutes. Of course. Thank you so much. Hi, Council and Mr. Mayor. Um, my name is Victoria Leback, and I am a housing and homelessness advocate, a disability rights advocate, and a bunch of other advocate things that I simply don't have time to tell you about. Um, I've read your entire budget report, and granted, I'm not a math person, okay, but I noticed in there that even though we were in a housing crisis, and I'm very, very happy about the steps that have been taken, um, there was only one small blurb about uh, shelters and other homelessness initiatives or initiatives to help the house, pardon me. Um, I'm just wondering, when we're in the middle of a crisis and this crisis is getting way worse and not better, although I do applaud council's decision to not only create those virtual units properly, even though it took longer, in my opinion, than it should have. It was done and we appreciate that. However, because of that, there are less shelter beds and our lower barrier shelter is currently gone. Uh, right now, we don't have a 24-7 warming center for the unhoused or people that might just be wandering around during the day and can't afford to even go get a coffee to warm up. Um, so based on these things that are happening right now, I strongly believe, as do other members of the PADS community network, that something should be put in the budget to operate and staff appropriately the 24 7 warming centers that we so desperately need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicki, for. Uh for your presentation and your and your advocacy this morning, I, I appreciate that. We will we will take that uh, uh, into consideration as we are uh, talking about the rest of the budget. Uh, thank you, CEO, CEO, uh and Vicky for uh, for stepping forward uh, again. This opportunity is open for everybody who would like to discuss uh, or to uh, present to the budget committee. At this point, I would like to. Move ahead with the uh, 
with the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda, on the adjusted agenda, would be the presentation from the CAO and then the um, and then the motion. So, Mr. Debay, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, members of Regional Council, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, happy to be here this morning to present the CAO business unit uh, proposed budget. The um, certainly, you know, it's a privilege. I've always considered a privilege and an honor to serve as CAO, and I appreciate this opportunity to, to speak about the CAO business unit today. With me is uh, Sally Christie, our, my senior advisor. Kim Carver, who's the executive director, or excuse me, executive coordinator to the CAO. Paul Johnson, managing director of government relations and external affairs. Tracy Jones Grant, managing director, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. Melody Campbell, who's manager of the Council Support Office. Amy Siciliano from Public Safety. Holly Richardson from Regulatory Modernization. Leticia Smiley from Food Security and Lisa Martin, our finance business partner with finance and asset management. Mr. Chair, I'm so grateful, so grateful for the great work they all do with the respective teams to deliver on council's priorities. Slide one, please. So the CEO business unit mission is to create a great place to live, work and play by becoming the best managed municipality in Canada. Slide two, please. The CEO business unit includes the CAO's office, the council support office, the mayor's office, and particularly in relation to its administrative support staff, government relations and external affairs that includes the public safety advisor to the CAO, social policy and planning, economic development and regulatory modernization, and the office of diversity and inclusion in the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. In November of last year, we also included two new deputy CAO roles. <clears throat> excuse me, DCAO of um, Citizen Services and the DCAO of Corporate Services, namely Denise Schofield and Caroline Blair-Smith, respectively. Slide three, please. So this slide speaks to what we do as a business unit. So the CAO Administrative Office provides corporate-wide leadership, strategic direction, and operational guidance to all business units. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova, Scotia, no, African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office, or ANZIO, is focused on building an inclusive organizational culture that values and reflects the diverse community that we serve. Government Relations and External Affairs, or GRIA, supports regional council priorities through the provision of strategic advice to the corporation on a range of initiatives. This includes intergovernmental relations, economic development, public safety, social policy, regulatory modernization and relationships with the business improvement districts and the Halifax partnership. The office of the mayor, of course, is, is they, uh, the staff there, uh, coordinate constituent relations, communications and administrative support to the mayor. Council support office coordinates constituent relations, communications and administrative support for members of council. The deputy chief administrator Administrative Officer, Citizen Services, provides leadership and oversight to planning and development, parks and recreation, transportation and public works, fire and emergency services, and Halifax Branson. The Deputy Chief Administrative Officer of Corporate Services provides leadership and oversight to human resources in corporate communications, information technology, legal and risk, finance and asset management, and corporate and customer services. Slide four, please. So what does a CAO do? Well, the CAO provides executive leadership to the HRM organization, manages reports to regional council and its committees, is responsible for fiscal stewardship in relation to our people and our financial and physical assets. For example, it is my responsibility to prepare the annual budget for regional council's consideration and to operate the various programs of the, of the municipality effectively and efficiently in keeping with council's vision, mission, values, and strategic priorities. CAO also promotes a positive corporate culture, provides leadership for strategic initiatives and major projects, ensures met engagement with stakeholders and communities, and manages issues in collaboration with the mayor, councillors, and the CAO staff team 
and Arms Lines partners like Halifax Water, Discover Halifax, Events East, the Halifax Port Authority, universities and colleges, the, Stan the Halifax Stanfield International Airport, and the Halifax Partnership. Slide five, please. So let's talk a little bit about Halifax and you know, certainly council has adopted a very robust climate action plan that one of our previous speakers just mentioned. And um, you know, that Halifax will only work if we all do our part. And um, certainly every business unit has a role to play in that in relation to what we completed this year in terms of the, in terms of the CAO's office, uh, you know, we, we've had, we've undertaken st stakeholder engagement on environmental projects and impacts with Nova Scotia Power, Amera, Halifax Water, Halifax Port Authority, and provincial government partners. I was glad to hear the Premier say this morning that uh, they were going to legislate uh, measures to, to ensure that um, our solar city program uh, can continue under the current, uh, under the current uh, rules that's very encouraging and we're looking forward to seeing that legislation ceo's office also establishes and increases the profile of the environment and climate change division within the organization and we've we've increased staff capacity for that for the implementation of that including uh, an appointment of a director recently in the in the person of shannon medima bria will continue to support any legislative amendments and consultation required to support halifax mandate such as staff engagement on, on the coastal protection act uh, Gria also can use to support any legislative amendments required with the provincial government. Uh, and we were quite successful in the past year in some of these, uh, some of these uh, legislative amendments and uh, changes to the Halifax Charter. Gria will support any infrastructure applications required to implement Halifax mandates, Halifax mandates and such as funding proposals for the electrification of Halif Halifax transit buses. We're actively in, in process, that team is uh, Working with several business units now on on the on responding to the recent call by both the province and the federal government in terms of their uh, programs, infrastructure programs. We continue to re reduce paper consumption internally with digital approvals and regional council packages. Uh, we've approved in the past year the flex work policy effective in 2021, which enables staff to work from home and thereby reduce vehicle emissions. We've, we provide a diversity, equity, inclusion lens on the work of Halifax through the great work of Tracy Jones and her team, working with all business units. We will continue to work with the Environment Climate Change uh, Division to provide leadership and support their initiatives as we move forward, as we have in the past. So slide six, please. So these are a summary of chance staff changes. We've had, we have 9.7 new positions across the CEO business unit, RIA and diversity and inclusion. And I'll talk about what those specific positions are in those sections when we get to slide eight. Slide seven, please. This is the overview of the operating budget. It's a high level overview. More detail will be provided in the next few slides, but the proposed budget compensation and benefits have increased by $1.5 million. And this includes 9.7% new positions and one transfer position, as well as other salary increases uh, and adjustments. So the breakdown in relation to the new and transfer positions is $1.31 million and the ISA, which is the performance, the performance adjustments for non-bargaining staff and other other salary adjustments uh, amount to about $194,000 for a total of $1.5 million. Other goods and services uh, increased by $222,000, including approximately 50% of COVID costs were added back in 21-22 and adding back the other 50% for 22-23 in areas of conferences, out-of-town travel, local travel, community events, and miscellaneous adjustments and membership with Canada's big city executive partnership, which is a collection of the top eight city, uh, top the, the top eight municipalities in Canada, uh, where the city managers of, or CAOs of those respective municipalities get together uh, quite often to talk about common interests and, and advocate for changes at the federal level. Uh, so you'll see the various uh, items there on the slide. Other fiscal. This includes transfers to outside agencies, grants, interagency payments, and they may have increased by $658,000. And I'll go through the details on the next slide. Um, so slide eight, please. 
as outlined on slides in slide six, we have 9.7 new positions throughout our unit. And uh, I'll provide more detail now as we review the operating changes in the slide. So the CAO's office change in budget of uh, $1.1 million. This includes four new, four new positions, the two deputy CAOs and the two coordinators that they have to have to support their work. Uh, salary increases across the business unit, membership with Canada's big city executive partnerships for 20,000 bucks. Deputy CAO non-compensation budgets, in other words, uh, their, their office uh, operations, uh, memberships, those kinds of things, 59,000. COVID add backs, uh, we added 50% back from the recast budget cuts. Councillor support office, uh, the change in budget is, budget is 46,000, which represents COVID add backs and salary increases with the staff. Versity and inclusion, uh, the change in budget is $421,000. This includes 4.7 new positions, an Indigenous Community Outreach and Research Coordinator to, re to, to work with Cheryl Kopas gehu uh, the Anti-Black Racism Program Coordinator to support the work we're doing on in, in our Anti-Black Racism Strategy, the Workplace Assistant to the Accessibility Advisor, the Administrative Assistant, and, and uh, the DNI Policy Research Intern. The last portion of the anti-black racism uh, funds, $110,000 required to run the program were included, as well as saying general average the salary increases that apply to, to all staff, uh, whether bargaining or non-bargaining. The GRIA uh, change in budget is $770,000. Uh, that includes one new position, which is the housing and homelessness coordinator. And, the, and uh, that's Sue Kelleher. As you know, you've probably met her already. Uh, we're including her position now in the, in the full year and one transfer from uh, planning and development, which is food security. And that's Lakeisha Smiley, who's now joining the GRIA team as part of our, 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 our broader social policy efforts across the organization to better integrate all of those within, within one division. They also include salary increases within that division. And of course, uh, the Halifax Partnership, 2% increase in the Halifax Partnership grant, which represents $38,000. There's a budget transfer in there from IT, Information Technology, where the Civic Halifax Civic, Civic Innovation Outpost at Volta was previously, that's 260,000. We had a budget transfer from Planning and Development, which is Food Security and Systems Planning. And uh, the Rural Economic Development, so we've, we've we included in the budget $160,000 to hire a rural economic development officer and a rural tourism, tourism development officer who will actually be embedded within the rural economic development officer will be embedded within the Halifax partnership and the rural development officer, tourism development officer will be embedded within the Discover Halifax. So there'll be a grants to those respective organizations to cover the cost of those salaries of those particular positions to have a greater focus on rural economic development and rural tourism. Of course, we also have some COVID add backs in, in there. The mayor's office, uh, minor, very small change in budget, $4,600. That's basically, there's a decrease in salaries here due to no increase for the mayor and other decreases due to attrition and turnover. And there's some COVID add backs and that's out, that all that's out to $4,600. Slide nine, please. So under the operating uh, summary of changes chart, I've given the details of the new positions and other budget adjustments already, but note under revenue adjustments, the Department of Justice grant was reduced by $28,500 for public safety's community mobilization team. And that number was offset by the grant from immigration, refugees and citizenship Canada, an increase of $10,000 for the Halifax Immigration Partnership Program. Um, just so you know, during COVID, we added budget to revenue for uh, for carryover of funding from the Department of Justice to help with COVID budget cuts. And this year, we were bringing back in line with the actual grant amount of seventy five thousand. The proposed grant for accessibility advisor workplace assistant thirty thousand nine hundred dollars. So, as you know, we have an accessibility advisor, and uh, an individual needs a a, a, a uh, an assistant to carry out the work. So we are. We are funding the, in part, the workplace advisor, workplace assistant uh, to the advisor, uh, and there's other monies that uh, the province pays to fund that position in total. And that's what that is all about. Uh, the other budget adjustments: we remove the economic recovery plan from last year, uh, which is 135,000. We remove public safety policing review from last year. 
uh, of 100,000. So if we're spending over two fiscal years and we'll be funded next year from fiscal services. We added 50%, uh, we added back 50% to our budget that was cut from the recast budget during 21-22 or 20, sorry, 2021 due to COVID. And then we received the other 50% in 2122 in the amount of $207,000. So the details are on that are uh, public safety funding, there's 37.8 uh, office costs are up by about 9,700, conferences and travel costs, 83,300. 83, Training is around 20,900. Counselor advertising is 27,600. Community events is 21,900. And other miscellaneous, uh, 6,700. So you can appreciate we're, we're being optimistic here in terms of uh, COVID impacts and uh, you know, we're bringing back some of, these, uh, some of these things that we've not been able to do due to COVID, but we, we sense that, they're, that we're, on the, we're, on the, we're getting to the other side of uh, COVID and uh, hopefully it'll become endemic. We'll just have to live with it. and. Uh, Continue the good work we've always been doing in terms of uh, in terms of uh, external external affairs and uh, and conferences and training and those kinds of things. So next slide, please, slide ten. I would, and I will now turn the presentation over to Paul Johnson, Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Jacques, and. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Um, as Jacques mentioned, I'm Paul Johnston, Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs, uh, or GRIA, as I will probably refer to it throughout the presentation. Uh, so I'll just be running through our main deliverables for the upcoming year that relate directly to uh, Council's priority areas. Uh, so next slide, please. So first, under a prosperous economy, economic growth, um, as you all know, we've been working diligently with the Halifax Partnership to develop the renewed five-year economic growth plan. So within the next couple of months, the proposed plan will be brought to both the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, uh, and then to Regional Council for review and approval. In the coming year, we'll begin implementation and tracking of the, uh, of the brand new plan. So as with the uh, existing strategy that is just wrapping up its five-year term, uh, deliverable and other de deliverable, sorry, and other responsibilities will be outlined in a revised service agreement with the Halifax Partnership, which will be brought to Council for approval along with the strategy. Uh, as part of this work, we'll continue to support the Halifax Partnership's work on the Connector Program, Atlantic Innovation Pilot, and other initiatives that aim to attract talent to Halifax. And in conjunction with our colleagues at Diversity Inclusion and their work on the immigration strategy, uh, the partnership will maintain its programs aimed at retaining new immigrants, recent graduates, and internationally trained workers. Uh, also in the area of economic growth, we will continue our joint effort with the partnership to make the municipality a living lab through the Halifax Civic Innovation Outpost at Volta. As Jacques mentioned that uh, the budget for that uh, project has now been transferred into our unit. So in 2022-23, the outpost will develop prototypes to solve complex social issues and improve HRM service delivery, uh, develop for-profit prototypes to tackle climate change, and beta test local startup products and services. Uh, and finally, as a key component of our government relations role, and as uh, the CAO mentioned in relation to Halifax, We'll continue to identify opportunities through funding programs and coordinate applications that will assist us in undertaking key infrastructure projects that support municipal priorities. Uh, so under inclusive and affordable communities, we will coordinate, continue, I should say, to coordinate the implementation of uh, HRM social policy with an emphasis on its three focus areas, food security, housing and homelessness, and connected communities. As directed when council approved the policy in May of 2020, we established a social policy team comprised of staff from throughout the organization that are working together to tackle this work. Uh, as you are uh, very much aware, one area in which we have become increasingly engaged in the past year is homelessness. So in the coming year, we will explore ways to better coordinate and define the municipality's role in supporting the province's mandate in this area. Now that we have some new staff in place, uh, our focus needs to move towards working in conjunction with community stakeholders uh, and provincial staff so that we don't rush into decisions without proper input and dialogue. In addition, we hope to strike a better balance between responding to the immediate crisis 
while also developing more strategic and longer term sustainable solutions. Uh, also in relation to homelessness, we will sustain our ongoing support for the Street Outreach Navigator program that we fund in partnership with four business improvement districts. Uh, a new addition to GRIA, as uh, Jacques mentioned as well, as of April 1st will be food security and we are thrilled to have Letitia Smiley joining our team uh, and she's also with us today. Uh, so on the front of food security, engagement for the Just Food Action Plan began in 2021 and findings from this engagement as well as ongoing collaboration and research will lead to a draft action plan in 2022. Phase two will refine the draft plan and generate commitments to realize the funding, human resources, governance, performance measurements, and other supports needed to operationalize Just Food Halifax. Uh, next slide, please. So under safe communities, uh, the public safety strategy is a roadmap for making evidence-based upstream investments in community safety and well-being, with the goal to reduce crime, criminalization and victimization and the impacts on individuals, families and communities. Since its implementation back in uh, 2018, we've increased our understanding that responsibility for public safety reaches far beyond the traditional realm of just policing. We've advanced a more collaborative approach and increased support to communities that are disproportionately impacted. In late 2019, Halifax joined a growing number of cities worldwide working to address sexual violence and harassment in public spaces by joining the UN Women's Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces for Women and Girls program. In 2021, we hired a coordinator to lead this program and she is working to build partnerships, develop policies and ensure the municipality is investing in evidence-based approaches to safety for women, girls, and gender diverse people. The coordinator also leads the Women's Safety Assessment Tool, a community-led approach to improving safety in public spaces. To address priority areas related to substance use and misuse, the Public Safety Advisor will work with key stakeholders and identify resources to fund the development of a municipal drug strategy. In spring uh, 2021, the advisor submitted a proposal to Public Health Canada to advance this work with several partners. Per Council's direction, this focus on substance use also includes engaging partners to develop a business case and potential cost model for a sobering centre in Halifax. Another key piece of community outreach work has been carried out by the Public Safety Office and, uh, and the advisor in particular in recent years is the Community Mobilization Team model. So in 2022-23, we'll continue to strengthen the, capa the capacity and impact of the four existing community mobilization teams in uh, communities throughout HRM. And last but certainly not least, uh, probably the biggest piece of work on, on Amy's, uh, Amy's docket right now with an eye to developing a renewed public safety strategy in a couple of years. The Public Safety Office will continue to address Council's direction to coordinate a review of policing services and structure and assess potential alternatives to service delivery. Uh, and I should say, uh, unfortunately, Amy, our public safety advisor is not here today to take questions uh, due to a death in her family. She is uh, in Ontario dealing with uh, the death of her, her father this week. Uh, so if there are questions, I'll do my best, but uh, Amy would be more than happy to provide uh, responses or additional information in, uh, in follow-up to today's session. Uh, next slide, please. So um, back to uh, the prosperous economy priority. Uh, finally, or the final slide, sorry, is uh, the regulatory modernization project. So council adopted the Charter of Governing Principles for Regulation Administrative Order in 2018 to guide how new regulation or changes to existing regulation are considered. Uh, the first four years of the project is focused on developing regulatory impact assessment tools and making small but tangible regulatory changes. Uh, in the coming year, this work will focus on continuing to partner with the province and engaging stakeholders to deliver specific projects in mutual areas of priority under the phase three joint project action plan to reduce red tape for business. Uh, continuing to develop a framework to improve regulation as a tool and helping advance strategic policy outcomes, including further work on regulatory impact assessment tools, development of an inclusive stakeholder engagement strategy, 
implementation of regulatory priorities aligned with the new economic growth plan and initial work on a more coordinated corporate policy approach. Finally, we'll implement a performance measurement framework for the program to support decision-making through development of baseline indicators, data collection, analysis, and reporting of red tape reduction and regulatory modernization results, establishment of service improvement targets, and identification of specific regulatory improvement areas. And I should note that uh, Holly Richard Richardson, uh, who is our lead on regulatory modernization, is here today to answer any questions in this area. Uh, and just thanks so much to Holly for all of her, her great work in this area over the last couple of years. So that is it for me. I'm now happy to turn the virtual floor over to my uh, brilliant colleague, Tracy Jones Grant. Good morning, all. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a brief uh, background on what's happening with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion African Nova Scotian Affairs as it relates to Council's priorities. Uh, key work that we will be undertaking this year uh, is the African Nova Scotian Road to Economic Prosperity Action Plan, which we do in partnership with the Halifax Partnership and our community partners. Um, we are into our third year of supporting this plan and look forward to the outcomes from it. We are already seeing its impact on the African Nova Scotia community and in particular in the way that we as a municipality work with our African Nova Scotia communities. Just unplug my earphones and hopefully this will be better. Our next a significant piece of work is our work on the task force on the commemoration of Edward Cornwallis and the recognition and commemoration of Indigenous history. We are working on year two of that plan. And as you saw from the budget, we have um, identified the need for support to work with our Indigenous advisor. This is a big portfolio and a lot of the work of the team of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, ANCO, is across all aspects and all business units of the municipality and it is becoming far too great for one person to manage alone so we're pleased to see that um, we're looking at adding uh, a coordinator to work with our Indigenous advisor. Our accessibility strategy is on track in alignment with the province We've already met two of the requirements, one of them being that we have an accessibility advisory committee. Our accessibility advisor also sits on various committees of the province. So we're really pleased with seeing how that is moving forward. We will be developing a gender equity strategy in the upcoming year. Gender equity is a priority of council as it is for all of the municipality. We have an individual who is leading this work and currently we are engaged in external consultations. COVID has impacted our ability to meet and connect with community, but working with our community partners, we have been able to host some sessions where we are able to hear directly from the community where they see we should be going with a gender equity strategy. Our immigration strategy was originally developed many years ago um, and is supported through our local immigration partnership. This year, we were pleased that the federal government provided us with additional funds to be able to hire an additional staff person to support the work of the local immigration partnership. We also, through the Local Immigration Partnership, launched a new website that brings uh, service providers and information together in one space so that new immigrants and service providers can have a one-stop shop. And that website is called newinhalifax.ca, brand new, and it's supported through our immigration um, pro program funded by the federal government. We will be developing a municipality specific immigration strategy and we have already done some external consultations. We've just completed internal consultations. So the work continues on that. Anti-Black racism is a priority and it's, it's so pleasing to see that this isn't just something that came up. We talked about it and we dropped it. 
This is a permanent piece of work of the municipality. We are working with uh, internal partners, external partners. The work is continuing. Currently, we are now doing consultations with community on what they feel should be part of an anti-racism, anti-Black racism strategy for the municipality. Those consultations are happening right now with the community and we will gather that information and we will prepare a strategy. French service strategy was approved last year. We are into the next phase of that and things are moving along. We are increasing the number of employees who have been able to to um, access French language training that is provided through a grant through the provincial government. We are seeing increased communications to our communities in French language, and we are constantly being consulted on how we can support our Acadian and Francophone communities. Diversity and inclusion framework, we are pleased to say that we are in year three of this strategy. Again, it is moving along um, fantastically. One of the components of this that is very important to the organization is the training. We have expanded significantly the training programs that we offer to our employees within HRM. We have new accessibility training. We have um, included a new gender equity training module. We've also over the past year during COVID as the municipality has been impacted by issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, our team has rallied and developed and provided the resources to support our employees. That is all part of the work of the diversity and inclusion framework. Annually, we present a report to council and each and every business unit within the municipality has identified diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, and we're able to report to you on the work that is done through that. So those are the initiatives out of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affair that support council's priorities. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure who we have as the next speaker, but that uh... That is the last slide that I have uh, on my slide deck. So thank you very much uh, for those who have presented from the office of the CAO. Uh, Jacques, I see you on the camera. Would you like to proceed? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, we're, uh, we're happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, we have uh, Councillor Mancini. Uh, would you mind, uh, Councillor, uh, putting the motion on the floor first? And I've got the motion. Yeah, uh, happy to do so, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll put the following motion on the floor that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Corporate and Customer Service proposed 2022-23 budget and business plan as set out in the discussed in the company report dated January 26, 2022 and supporting presentation into the draft 2022-23 operating budget. So moved. Thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? Second. Second. Second, uh, uh, second I think from uh, Councillor Cuddle. Let's go with that. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jacques, and your team uh, for all, all the work. I just have you know, two questions. My first question is for Paul. Uh, Paul, can you give us a, an update where we are with regard to the... Um, I guess we uh, we refer to it as the drunk tax, not the most appropriate word, but uh, that's where we are with that uh, and uh, what the status is. Council direction was to go away and take a look at a different model on that. Can you just share with us where we are or when we expect to see that come back to you, Council? Just Sober, thanks for the sobering yeah. center. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. Philosophy, yeah. the much I, more appropriate word. I apologize for that. Sobering center. I got your drift. Um, through the, through the chair to the councillor, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, as you know, council uh, directed uh, us uh, specifically, Amy, to go away to come back with a, with a funding model. Um, so that re the report's been bumped a couple of times now due to um, conversations with the province uh, because they, they are interested in partnering on the model, but uh, we've, we've taken some time to kind of get a, a, a better sense of where they are in terms of potential partnership and funding. Uh, the other piece too now is, is now that we have the new um, staff uh, around homelessness and we're thinking about, um, you know, how, 
outreach services are provided throughout the municipality. Um, that that is factoring into it as well as as we really want to talk to our community partners as well as the province uh, to get a better handle on what you know a broader approach to outreach, including uh, the sobering center model, may look like. So. Uh, we're hoping probably in the in the summer maybe to, to come back with uh, with uh, some ideas around that. Um, just, you know, just kind of, sorry, go ahead, Bob. Finish. I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to say sorry. It gets back to the principle that I mentioned in the presentation that we really want to make sure that we're engaging with the right folks on the ground and not not kind of rushing into models without talking to our, our partners in the community. So. Yeah. Thank you for that, Paul. I just you know uh, everything is connected, right? So we're. Uh, in a few weeks time we'll be talking about the police budget and there's the uh, report that Ms. Jones has done with regard to uh, defunding or reallocating policing funds and the sobering center is a piece of that so I'm just curious where that is on top of it. I do want to take this moment Paul to thank you for you and your team for your work on the homelessness file. This is all new to you and us and all of us and I know there's been lots of zigging and zagging and then Appreciate your work on that. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chair, I have one more question for Tracy, if I may. Uh, uh, Tracy is not here. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Amy is not here. Yeah. Well, um, no, Tracy was looking yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Uh, hi, hi, Tracy. Uh, just a quick question. You may, you alluded to the Cornwallis work on the Cornwallis file. Uh, any update on that? What's Is there anything left, to be, left over from the task force to be done? And uh, if so, when can we get a more uh, thorough uh, update on that? To you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor, thank you for your question. So the task force came out with a report with a variety of recommendations. So Cheryl, working with GRIA, working with Parks and Recreation and others are looking at actioning those recommendations. Okay. I believe that there will be an updated council report on the task force. Um, I'd have to look at the specific date, but there's a, there's intentions to have an annual report. Okay. Um, things that we have been working on, for example, we've been looking at friendship accords. We've been looking working with our partners internally on um, the naming. So there's a lot of work that's happening, and there will be a, a report that will come to council that will detail what has happened under every recommendation. Okay, thank you. For that. I look forward to getting that update. And you know, Tracy, I'm a big fan of your department. You know that, right? Thank you so much. Thanks, Church. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Before we proceed, uh, two things. First of all, uh, on behalf of Regional Council, I would like to offer our most sincere condolences uh, to uh, Amy Siciliano and her family on, on uh, the loss of her father. Um, our thoughts and best wishes uh, go with you. Um, Secondly, uh, Councillor Mancini, the motion that you read was uh, the corporate and customer services motion. Oh, uh, CAO, my apologies. Yeah, so the uh, the difference do between again? those, I will, post, uh, do you have the motion with you? Yep, I do, yep, I can Beautiful, do if you could read the CAO motion, I'd appreciate it. My apologies, I did remember you re you switched the order, uh, and uh, I was paying attention, but obviously not well enough, <laughs> but I'll, I'll read it again. Uh, put the following motion on the floor that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Chief Administrative Officer's proposed 2022-23 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying report dated January 26, 2022, and supporting presentation into the draft 2022-23 operating budget so moved. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. You're welcome. The next person on my list is Councillor Dagle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't realize I was up so fast. Um, good. I'm not usually that quick on the uh, getting my name in the chat. The uh, Thank you, uh, Jacques and team, for the presentation. You know, I must say I really enjoy when we get to the budget conversation because it feels like it coalesces all of the initiatives with the money all at the same time, it just, it, it makes it much more easier to understand. Oops, you might be hearing my train in a minute. Um, there are three kinds of questions that I might have. And one is on the position for the rural economic development. I was thrilled to see that, thank you very much. And um, I believe in the report and maybe in our conversations, uh, that position will reside within the Halifax partnership. And I'm just wondering if we could have a briefing note that explains what the scope of that position might be um, and how it is integrated within um, the Halifax partnership. 
excuse me. And within that, when it says rural economic development, you made a comment about rural tourism. And I just may have missed that a little bit. So if you, uh, Jacques, wouldn't mind giving me a little bit of an explanation on that, that would be great. Um, trying to just get your head around where uh, rural focus is, uh, is great. So uh, happy to see that. The other one was the outreach um, and research indigenous coordinator position. And I know that uh, I had met with the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center with uh, Amy, I believe, and uh, they were talking and they presented at CPIT. So they were talking about the beautiful initiative that they're working with on um, Participatory Canada, everyone, every day. And I'm just wondering if that position is perceived to be the kind of link that they really need for the success of their program. They've got you know, federal, provincial monies. It's, it's a beautiful program. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to be able to support that program well. And the third question is just around the the whole diversity and inclusion um, uh, sort of business unit. I'm wondering if there's a way for us to find out what percentage of the energy is internal to HRM as an organization and what percentage of the energy is external that really is impacting how we make HRM a more inclusive municipality. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Schmidt, through you to Council Eagle Gammons, thank you for, very much for those questions. Uh, I will defer to Tracy on the on the outreach on the Indigenous coordinator position and the DNI uh, focuses. Uh, but I'll speak to the rural, rural economic development and rural tourism. So, we've had conversations with Halifax Partnership and Discover Halifax, and many of you actually uh, conversations over time, uh, where you know there is a. Uh, I think there's a recognition that we need to invest more time. Somebody needs to wake up in the morning and, and think about uh, rural economic development. So really this person would be hired by the partnership. We would provide a grant to the partnership. They would hire them as an economic development officer, focus on business retention and expansion and uh, working with the, the, uh, the investment attraction team at Halifax partnership. So really two focuses. One is, business retention and expansion, working with individual businesses in the rural, trying to expand, trying to support them, trying to match them up with programs, uh, various various federal provincial programs, whether it's export development, uh, whether it's strategic partnerships, joint ventures, you know, the whole gamut, run the whole gamut in terms of economic development, trade, export development, that kind of thing, right? Um, and uh, helping deal with startups, right? So it's, it's, it runs the whole gamut of economic development. So it's really community economic development, uh, and, and, uh, but it goes beyond that because they will be tapping into working with the team at Halifax Partnership and the province, Nova Scotia Business Inc., uh, COA, various agencies to make sure that the businesses in rural uh, are, are being well served by the partnership with some funding from uh, HRM. The same applies to the rural tourism piece in a, in a sense that that person will be hired by the by Discover Halifax. And uh, that person will work uh, with the Hal Discover Halifax team and with a focus on rural tourism. You know, we have the Wild Islands, we have uh, a lot of various operators. We have, you know, we have a, a lot of things, a lot of packaging that go on uh, that may not be happening today. Working with various uh, associations, we have a lot of we have different associations operating in different parts of HRM in, in rural areas. So they're a direct link to those associations. Uh, that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, you know, it's uh, let's say it's a modest investment under sixty thousand, but it's it's a worthwhile investment in terms of payback. That'll you know, you know, I I used to be the deputy minister of economic development in New Brunswick part of my career, and I ran an economic development agency at like another part of my career. Uh, very similar to the Halifax Partnership in the Greater Fredericton region, and uh, you know th those kind that kind of work uh, is important on the ground to make sure that people are connected to various programs and uh, that they get support and advice in terms of business planning and that kind of thing, and they can literally pay their salary. We don't see the payback necessarily directly at HRM, simply because um, a lot of the payback is in job creation, therefore income tax and sales tax and things like that. Where we do get a payback uh, is, uh, you know, perhaps in, in the real on the real estate side, if some of these businesses expand or, or build new, we get we get payback. So a lot of these, if you, if you look at it on the payback model, uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that these positions will will pay their will will return an investment to 
to HRM and Nova Scotia General or writ large. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith, go ahead. Um, excuse me, Mr. Oh, Chair. Sorry, Could sorry, go ahead. Uh, Tracy, answer the other part. Yep. My apologies. Thank to you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, the the uh, coordinator position most certainly will be supporting the Everyone Every Day initiative. Cheryl's work is so broad and there's such a demand and the voices of our in Indigenous community is growing so much stronger on what they want from the municipality. So Cheryl is heavily engaged with the Friendship Centre and with the Everyone Every Day program. So this coordinator will help Cheryl in that work and with a lot of the other work that she is doing to support our Indigenous community. What percentage of our work is internal and what percentage is external? Pre-COVID, we probably spent probably 60% working externally with community because that's how we gather the information to bring forward to impact changes in municipal services and programs. During COVID, of course, we couldn't engage as well and as much with community. So a lot of our work focused internally on supporting our business units and our employees to really understand diversity, equity, inclusion. So we did a lot of information sharing, um, lunch and learns, developed resources. Now that we're coming through COVID, I would say our work is probably going to be 50-50. We can't change how we do municipal services and programming if we don't hear directly from the communities that are impacted. That's why all of the strategies that we write that we bring forward to you as council to endorse are written after we've heard from the community and gotten their feedback and after we've heard from business units and gotten their feedback to develop a good robust um, strategy or plan for something that we want to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I might come back again, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dago Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair, and uh, Jacques, to you and everyone in between, uh, Tracy, Paul, and all the folks. Uh, you know, a huge, huge fan of all the work that's happening. And just to think about in 2016, when I was elected, where we've come since then. And I think a lot of residents don't realize how far we've actually come in, in that short time frame, depending who you are, uh, around how much improvements we've made when it comes to the world of social social issues, when it, when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, we, we've made strides in a fairly short, short time frame. And and I can see from your budget that that you and your team are taking this work seriously, uh, where, where before we wanted to do it, but we just didn't have the roadmap, where now we have the roadmap and we're putting the bricks down. So very, very pleased to see that. Um, two, two questions that I have is actually three. Um, one might be emotion, depending on where it goes, Jacques. So one is, is Tracy, just an update on Afroville. I know I, I got an email, but the public might want to just get an update on what's happening with the report and the status on the Afroville visiting process. Um, also uh, wondering related to the social policy, Paul, um, just if you can clarify again, I, I, I think there was an added person being, uh, a person being added to the office, just, and I'm, I might've heard that wrong, just wondering what that role would be. And the other one for you, Jacques, is at the last police commission meeting, we passed the motion to one, change the budget, uh, from the police commission to be in your office, but also uh, there's a motion made by a commissioner to add a hundred thousand dollars to the police commission budget uh, to help support the, the 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 work that's happening with on the police commission. So I'm just wondering if that's a motion that I have to make now to add it to the parking lot for later discussion, or uh, do I do that later on? Mr. Chair, I'll take the last question first, and then uh, I'll ask Tracy to comment on the visioning process and uh, Paul and Paul on the social policy. So police commission budget is not included in my budget at the moment. Uh, it's in the it's in the HRP. So the time for to make those that change would actually be at the police when the police comes forward uh, with their proposed budget. It was, it was kind of too late to change 
um, that the board of police commissioners just made that made that resolution on on Monday. So we will we will we will consider that council will have to consider that in the police budget. The same applies to the hundred thousand uh, dollars. That'll be part of the that'll be part of the, um, the conversation around the, at, that, at the police budget time. Um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with adding it now in the parking lot. You can make the motion now if you wish, but I think it's probably more appropriate for council to look at all the thing, all matters pertaining to the board of police commissioners and police services at one time. So that would be my advice. Um, Tracy, over to you. To you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Councillor Smith, your seven part motion is a big one. Um, <laughs> we are on the very, very last stages of pulling that together. It's going through its last steps in Report Center. It required getting a lot of internal information, um, especially when you've asked us to review such significant big documents and provide a response. Um, I must say that the, the work uh, on that visioning process is happening. Um, we are in conversations with funding partners. Um, we didn't do a whole lot because COVID would have meant we couldn't have properly engaged with community. And for this type of work, if we're gonna do a good vision for Africville, the surrounding lands, the descendants, those associated with Africville, you really need to be able to connect and virtually was just not going to work. So we have a, a plan in place. The report is, as I said, in its very last stages, it, it was seven pieces. Um, and I think you'll be pleased with what you will see very, very shortly. And we're really looking forward to connecting and getting back with the community as we move that visioning process forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Smith, does that take care of everything? If the last one was Paul, and then I won't even need to come back. Ah, okay, thank you. Yes, so through the chair to Councillor Smith, um, the uh, the new new social policy position actually isn't new to HRM. It's a transfer from planning and development. Oh, so the, the the food security planner, Letitia Smiley, uh, who's been doing lots of great work over with uh, planning and development, uh, is transferring to GRIA as of April 1st to work with the social policy team to come at, uh, at food security through more of a corporate lens. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an existing position that's been, uh, been transferred into our unit. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for these presentations. I'm very grateful to staff for the work that you do. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you've taken uh, over the last year to answer my questions and to work with me on various different initiatives and, and accessing information. Um, very happy to see the immigration strategy moving forward. Uh, this is so important to having a diverse and inclusive city. So. Thank you for that work as well for the accessibility strategy. I think we're really making strides here and uh, you know, it's full steam ahead. So again, thanks for that work. Um, in regards to the promoting uh, equitable access to municipal services, this is really important, uh, but I also would like to stress that it's not so much about just the promotion, it's also about the delivery and making sure that we're checking back uh, with our clients and with our customers and with residents and businesses to ensure that we're doing a good job. Getting a quality uh, check on the work and the delivery of those services is, is so important. Um, Paul, with, with regards to the regulatory improvement, um, you know, I, I'm, I just want to make sure that we have, I, I know that, you know, we have sort of, quote unquote, a great working relationship with Halifax Water, but I also want to make sure that we're working ahead and looking ahead uh, as far as aligning um, some of those, uh, you know, the regulatory uh, sort of improvement work and, and thinking forward, especially in regards to climate change, um, access to uh, quality um, services uh, from, a, from a nature perspective, right? So thinking about how are we leaving those wetlands when the stormwater is going through that and, uh, and also the naturalization uh, approach and making sure that we're uh, advising um, of the provincial government on ways that we could be working to align and improve our services together. 
Um, Jacques, for you, I, uh, I know that we've chatted about this before, so I'll raise it here again. Uh, the fact that the council support office doesn't have an annual plan is concerning. When I um, think about, you know, our goals overall with equity, inclusion and training and so on, I would like to see an annual plan uh, with council support to make sure that all councillors have access to the information, they have access to the training um, and coordinators have access to that training as well. So we're all aligned uh, with those equity and, and inclusivity goals. Um, and Jacques, really happy to hear that we're going to have somebody waking up every morning thinking about rural economic development. And thank you, Councillor Dago Gammon, for raising that because uh, I absolutely agree. You know, economic development isn't just about tourism. It is about the expansion, the support for those small businesses. They've been struggling uh, over the last couple of years. We've had businesses closing. Uh, we just heard, uh, you know, for example, uh, Julian's uh, uh, Bakery uh, is, is closing their doors. That's, that's terrible for uh, not only um, the, the businesses overall that support Julian's Bakery uh, to deliver their, their products and get them out to the market um, each day and each week, but uh, for Hubbard's Farm Market now, we won't have Julian's Bakery as a draw, which is, which is so important for those uh, other small businesses. Um, I guess I'll leave it there. I'll probably come back. I know that Amy's not here and condolences to her family. Uh, I do want to talk about public safety, but I think what I'll do is just wait until that conversation at Regional Council. Um, so thank you again for all of your work on this. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know if there was a question there or not. Uh, I didn't catch the question. I don't know if it's, sorry. Uh, yeah, there was a question on why the council's board office doesn't have an annual business. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. So I'll ask Mel to answer that. Mel? Okay, sorry, it's just taking me a couple of minutes to get up and, up and running here, but yes, uh, well, we're starting to work on some initiatives on sharing information among our our staff and counselors, uh, as you know, our main uh, objective in our office is to look after and service our clients and our residents of HRM. So uh, we are working and, and improving. And, and as you know, uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace, we have been meeting and discussing some initiatives moving forward. I am meeting with uh, IT this week to uh, to start some processes to uh, for for sharing information among all of us and uh, improving the office. So, so we will be you know you and I uh, and and the team will be have ongoing meetings to to uh, work towards our goals. Do you do you think that uh, the council support office that would could benefit uh, from having an annual plan, an annual business plan, uh, as far as setting out expectations? Well, our expectations are, are uh, you know, excellent customer service and excellent uh, resident services and services to our counselors. So, so we can we can discuss that uh, moving forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. My other question was for Paul Johnson in regards to regulatory improvement and working with Halifax Water. I'm thinking ahead uh, with regards to climate change. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Uh, through the through the Mr. Chair to the Councillor, it, it is a that's a really great question. And and um, to be to be honest, we've been we've been focused on the the work with the province and uh, for the last couple of years. And and one of the conversations we've been having is about um, how we sort of refocus more of this work internally uh, over the the coming year or two. And I think uh, there would be a fantastic opportunity to work with with Halifax Water as part of that. Uh, not something that we've done to date, but uh, certainly something we can uh, we can consider as we kind of refocus the work. So thanks very much for that idea. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you. Thank you, staff. 
Um, and uh, colleagues, a few of my questions have already been asked, and I just want to reiterate them because I think um, they are really important, uh, particularly around the rural economic development and tourism um, initiatives that uh, were presented. And you know, I think it's not it's not just about helping existing businesses or expanding existing businesses. It's also about developing a rural economic strategy. Um, you know, when we look at Halifax as a whole, we have, you know, industrial parks, we have Main Street initiatives, you know, we're, we're looking, we have the innovation, um, the innovation program. And, and so we're really looking at how we entice and, and, and enable businesses to grow and flourish. And so I'm just wondering if um, in that briefing note, if, uh, you know, something about the overall strategy can be, can be discussed or, or highlighted. Um, so I think, I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was around the citizen services and service delivery. Um, again, in particular in a rural context, I mean, I know we have, we all know we have a very large municipality and we have a, re we have a region to manage. And so some of the things that um, concern me are wondering how we're, how we're, providing access to anything like even if you take the appeals uh, standing committee requiring people to come from sheet harbor to city hall to attend a hearing you know are, are there any plans in looking at how we how we in a, support our our rural communities in accessing services and service delivery within our regional municipality and um finally i just had a question around the regulatory modernization um, you know, that I think that was, that group has been doing some amazing work in supporting business development. And I'm wondering if uh, Holly might be able to just provide a, a few highlights from the past year of what you've been working on. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Chuck. You're muted. First time today. <laughs> I guess my finger wasn't working. Um, so the rural economic development strategy. So you know, the Halifax partnership is coming up with a the new strategy for the next five years. And part of that strategy has a focus on rural. So you'll hear from the partnership on that. That's their uh, part of their focus is that. And this, of course, the, this body that we're going to be hiring, uh, providing them uh, funding for will, will be large part of their work will be to implement the strategy around rural. Um, it consistent with the with the economic development strategy that'll be coming before council actually very soon. Uh, it's going before the board this week. It's going to CPED after that, and then going to council in March. Well, you'll see that over the next month or so. Uh, a lot of a lot of conversations about strategy and CPED and um, and council have um, lots of opportunity to to uh, look at that, debate it, and uh, and uh, add, add value to it. On the uh, rural development, the rural delivery piece, um, you know, we, we we provide rural services across the piece through parks and recreation, through development services, through planning development, through uh, across all the business tra transportation, public works. So there's a heavy heavy focus on rural, obviously, like any like anything else we do. Uh, you did mention appeals, and that's a great point. Um, you know, perhaps some of the, some of these. Uh, when we have people that are living uh, two hours away uh, from City Hall and there's a meeting, maybe we can use technology, maybe we could go to them. Uh, that's a conversation, uh, you know, that could happen uh, with, the, with the municipal clerk and, uh, and the, when the legal, when the business student comes forward. Uh, I think uh, as I've seen Ian has done a great job in terms of uh, managing the clerk's office and how we operate there, but uh, I think uh, maybe an outreach strategy could be incorporated in, into that work as well uh, to see whether we can make, but we do, you know, we have community councils that, that do have, do exist. Uh, typically they don't meet in uh, Ecom Seacom or they don't meet in uh, necessarily in Hubbard, to your point. So there, there may be uh, maybe opportunity to expand some of our uh, outreach and, and other in different kinds of meetings that are held um, in, the, in the rural, if, if that's what you're getting to. Um, and I think uh, on that, I'll pass over to Holly. Good morning, uh, Holly Richardson, uh, project lead for regulatory modernization. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, to the council. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the last uh, year plus, uh, staff uh, have been working on a few um, components of regulatory modernization. One of those includes the joint project for regulatory modernization, which is a partnership between HRM and the province to reduce red tape business. Um, and uh, COVID has been a little bit uh, challenging as well. We've, we've been able to make some progress in a few areas. And uh, one of those is uh, by using a new uh, collaboration model uh, called the Regulatory Priorities Table. Uh, we were able to bring together uh, a roll up your sleeve working group uh, with key municipal staff and provincial staff to look at um, digging into uh, the issues surrounding uh, the potential regulation of e-scooters in Halifax. Uh, it's an issue that um, <clears throat> has been uh, emerging and certainly on our doorstep for the last uh, few years. So we've been able to work with the province uh, to be able to uh, come up with a proposal for changing uh, provincial legislation uh, to enable uh, municipalities to, to manage that issue uh, better through potential regulations. So uh, council may be seeing uh, that come forward in, in the near future, pending uh, provincial um, decision making on that. Um, we're also working with the province to look at um, uh, a few sort of mutual regulatory issues uh, to see if we can collaborate more. And one of those is uh, some challenges that uh, HRM is facing around um, regulatory barriers uh, that impact hiring and, and training of building officials. Uh, so we're working with the province to look at really kind of dissecting like, what are the uh, what is the legislative framework uh, now? Um, what does the training regime look like uh, for the uh, organizations and the systems that do um, the certification training? How can we um, update and modernize the, those so that it is uh, easier for the municipality to be able to keep pace with building official needs. Um, and then one of the uh, items that the municipality has been uh, working on as part of a continuous red tape reduction uh, for business focus is um, we understand that uh, a key performance indicator for our regulatory moderation work is business confidence in our regulatory environment and business customer satisfaction. So uh, back in the summer, we, we, uh, we conducted a business confidence survey uh, and asked um, various questions around um, uh, red tape reduction, sorry, red tape uh, prevalence in HRM, where areas that HRM could be focusing on the improved service delivery, um, and uh, council will be seeing results of that survey uh, come forward in um, okay. uh, Holly. spring of, of Holly. this year. Uh, and, you know, that, that provides... Holly, if, if, I can, if I can interrupt. Yes. If I can interrupt, Holly. Um, we have been having some difficulty hearing uh, your audio, and if you could turn off uh, your camera that might help improve it. Uh, the last clear thing that I heard was going back to the uh, regulatory framework and the red tape reduction. So I apologize for, uh, for interrupting, but uh, some of us have been having difficulty with the audio. I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair. Is if I uh, turn off the video, is that helpful? It is helping at this point, but we'll have to see as it goes forward. Thank you. So go ahead. 
Okay, um, so I'm sorry, and and actually, my um, I'm having some trouble with the uh, with the sound um, as well. Sounds like it's from my end. Um, the last piece that I was mentioning is that uh, staff in HR have conducted a, a business confidence survey uh, to hear from businesses across HRM. Um, in terms of where are the areas that we could be focusing specifically to reduce red tape. That survey was conducted in uh, summer of this year and council will be seeing the results of that uh, in the next few months. And we'll use those results to identify specific service improvement areas. One of the main things we heard from business was uh, the time it takes to get uh, approvals for various uh, permits and licenses. So we'll come back to council with some uh, results and recommendations, and we would use that survey as a baseline uh, and, and uh, conduct it likely every 18 months uh, with businesses to measure how we're improving with our red tape production initiatives. Thank you, Holly. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, Councillor Austin, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you staff for the presentation, all the ongoing work, uh, lots of great initiatives um, uh, coming out of CAO's office areas. Um, the one that I wanted to ask about, and it's just going back to the briefing note we had on Halifax, um, you know, I'm trying to do this with uh, with all, all our departments to scroll through and just see, see what's listed uh, for each and how that aligns with what's presented. Um, and so under CAO's office, we have uh, staff uh, capacity implementation and establishing climate change office. And so my question for Jacques would just be on the, um, I think the move of moving environment over into corporate services, which of course we'll hear about more uh, when, they, when they present uh, today. Uh, I think that's a good one. It aligns nicely. I, I'm just wondering, is, uh, is there further work still being done in this area the, uh, of how uh, that climate change office will actually function, function within the municipality? Yes, for you, Mr. Chair, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, the John McPherson will be responsible overall executive leadership and sponsor for Halifax. We'll, we'll be looking at that, working with Santa Media and the team. Um, you'll see in the business plan, there, I'm sure there'll be resource requirements that they'll come forward with. Uh, so, you know, the organization of that will be presented to you at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, as far as my role goes, is to make sure that those things happen. Right, and uh, make sure things are in the budget and uh, you know, appropriate information is presented to council for approval as we move forward with that. So uh, you know that's a, a work in progress, but uh, you know there'll be uh, there'll be a presentation by John and his team uh, as we move forward with that uh, with that implementation. Okay, uh, thank you, Jacques. And so then the other one, just uh, you you, fit, you fit into it very nicely uh, on the staffing piece. I mean, we when we talked about this committee, the whole when we talked about this in environment committee, uh, do we really have the right staffing um, piece in place for the coming year in terms of Halifax? Because it's not just staff within the uh, climate change uh, energy environment group. It's you know it's it's sprinkled throughout the organization. And you know the answer from Shannon uh, when she responded was uh, no, I don't necessarily need more staff because there's an onboarding scaling up process. I'm just uh, she kind of there was a little bit of a bend though in the last uh, committee of the whole on that, and so I'm just wondering, um, you know. The staffing piece is 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 it is this the good time to be kind of raising that, or should this be part of um, the discussion when John McPherson uh, comes forward, whether or not we have the right people um, planned in the coming year, or whether we could use some more? Yeah, the uh, I'm the right time for that is with John McPherson's business unit. He's got the you know now 
you know, what we're what you're going to see in each business unit is what they're doing in terms of Halifax. Each business plan, like you have see mine today, has you know mention of that and what we're actually doing on the ground here in my office and, and various pieces of that. So I'm, you know, I know that Shannon is ramping up. You know, there's been a, through Kelly's leadership, Peter Peter Duncan and Shannon and her team, they're they're ramping up based on the approval positions that have been approved so far. And you know, as we as we start to accelerate our efforts on on climate change and the rolling of the Halifax plan, every year you're probably going to see uh, adjustments to the resourcing plan. So you know, you can expect to see that, and you'll you'll see within each business unit as well what they're doing. And you know, we're we are very confident that we have the resources, the plant resources either in place or plan to be put in place to to actually execute on this plan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jacques. I will uh, come back when uh, later today when John McPherson's up. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a heads up for uh, for all of council uh, after the CAO presentation, before we go to corporate and customer services, uh, there will be another presentation by Jerry Blackwood on um, on on the uh, the budget process as we are at this point. We're starting down the second uh, list of speakers and uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Uh, actually, I'm good because Councillor Austin just uh, raised the concerns that I have, so thank you. Beautiful, thank you very much. In that case, uh, Councillor Dago Gammon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to firm up from our previous conversation that I brought forward, uh, I would like to make a motion that the Budget Committee request the CAO to provide a briefing note with an overview and scope of the rural economic development positions within the strategies of the Halifax Partnership and Discover Halifax. Thank you. Do we have, thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, is there anything on that, Councillor Dago Gammon? Um, not really. I think we've already had the conversation, so um, I'm good. We're just going to make it more formal. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, would you be okay with a show of hands for a vote, or would you rather a named vote for? Chair Russell, we do have in our administrative order one that votes in budget committee of the whole do require a vote call. Thank you. Please go ahead. Beginning with district one, Councilor Dago Gammon. Voting in favor. Two, Councilor Hensby. Uh, absolutely affirmative, especially for the rural development. Three, Councilor Kent. Four, Councilor Purdy. And sorry, but, um, Ian, I, I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councilor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Outhead. Councillor Outhead. Mayor Savage. In favor. Councillor Outhead, can you hear me? Chair Russell, that vote has passed. We will connect with Councillor Outhead to see what's happening on his end. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, we are back on the main motion. I see no further speakers. Um, so um, for the question. I didn't hear that, Councillor Mason, but I think you called for the question on the main motion. Uh, Indeed so I did, Ian, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, if we could proceed on the vote on the main motion, please. Beginning with District 2, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Hensby. District 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. Housing. And so we've been meeting. Councillor Henry, was that a yes? Yes, sir. Affirmative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. District three, Councillor Purdy. District four, yes. 
District 5, Councilor Austin. In favor. District 6, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. District 7, Councilor Mason. For the motion. District 8, Councilor Smith. For. District 9, Councilor Cleary. Yes. District 10, Councilor Morse. In favor. District 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. District 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. District 13, Councilor Lovelace. Yes. District 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. District 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. District 16, Councilor Outhead. Mayor Savage. In favor. District 1, Councilor David Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. Thank you. That motion passes. Um, so thank you very much to uh, Jacques and his entire team uh, for that presentation and and the uh, and the motion. Um, we are now moving over to uh, Jerry Blackwood with the uh, presentation on the council budget process. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, and, and apologies. We were, uh, this is just going to take a couple of minutes, but just thought it would be uh, just a little bit of a refresher and take council back to kind of where we are and what has been approved and, and direction uh, given on at this point. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. So uh, the budget committee uh, process. So <clears throat> back on November 23rd, we had a, it was our starting point with our uh, initial fiscal framework. So we had, uh, I think it was the 23rd and we were back again on, on the 26th to, to get direction to go forward and, and build, uh, uh, build the budget and to uh, uh, build a funding plan around uh, and design a tax rate. Uh, <clears throat> the next piece that came forward was a capital budget on December 14th. So at that time, you approved the base capital budget and advanced tender list. And um, just an update on that, that our uh, final uh, capital books will be coming forward very, very shortly. Last Friday, January 28th, was our uh, fiscal framework update. And uh, really appreciate the, the great... Uh, the good discussion and, and debate on that and the, uh, the direction given to council to uh, go forward on, uh, on the uh, 4.6 option, option uh, to be with, uh, with uh, increased uh, debt options. So today what is happening is, is we're starting the budget unit presentation. So all um, uh, our business units will be coming forward as the CAO just, just presented. So that, that's where we are right now. So we will have those budgets uh, uh, committees uh, coming forward uh, over the next month. And um, <clears throat> on Friday, we'll be back again with, uh, with the rest, I think, of the corporate uh, services uh, group. So on March 23rd, you'll, you'll get to debate the, the budget adjustment list or what we, we call the BAL. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, that in a second. And, um, and on April 12th is what we have scheduled for the, the final budget and, uh, and tax rate uh, approval, right? So as we mentioned on Friday, nothing is final until the final budget comes back to, to council. Next slide, please. So uh, in the business unit presentations, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, you'll see is that there could be items coming over that are over budget. So these are items that, that increase the budget uh, as presented. So they could require a, uh, a tax rate uh, increase and uh, a motion is required to add these to the budget adjustment list. Um, when they when items are added to the budget adjustment list, they will uh, come back for debate, and council will be provided with a briefing note on those. You can also you'll also be presented with items that are under budget. So these are items that that decrease the budget, 
and uh, they can be uh, 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 by motion moved to the balance uh, adjustment list as well. You'll also see uh, financial risk presented. These, these are not re requests to change the budget, but they're basically information uh, for council to um, inform just on, on, uh, on risks of uh, budget and, and service delivery and potential issues. Next slide, please. So we just spoke about the budget adjustment lists or what we call, what we call the parking lot. So um, as we move through the business unit uh, budget committees uh, for each new committee, any items that, that council moves to the balance, balance adjustment list, we will provide, uh, we'll provide a summary uh, through a handout in terms of what, uh, what has been approved to go there for debate and uh, as well the financial uh, impacts. Next slide, please. And then just a little bit of an overview of what you can expect to see in each uh, business plan presentation. So you're gonna see four financial tables and I think you know this has been brought up uh, through the fiscal framework uh, as well in terms of information. So. You'll have four tables. One will be uh, a service area budget overview, right? Those are the details by the, the divisions or service groups within the business unit. You'll then also have a summary of expenditures and revenues. So this is uh, a, a sort of a summary detail of uh, business unit revenues and expenses. And uh, you'll also get a table on the budget change summary. So that really walks you through what, what changed uh, from the last budget you approved to, to this budget and uh, has some variance analysis about that. And of course, uh, the, the other table is on the uh, FTEs or what we call full-time equivalents. So that will uh, provide details on uh, new positions and it will have it broken out between what is funded through operating and what is funded through capital. Next slide, please. And these are just uh, samples of the table as, as you would have uh, just saw in the uh, CAO's uh, budget presentation. Uh, next slide, please. And as previously mentioned, I uh, know this is a table that council has always been very interested in. It's uh, the changes in uh, full-time equivalents. So I'd uh, be happy to take any, any questions on process, but uh, this was just a, a bit of a, uh, just an overview, just to uh, give council a refresher on where we are in the process, uh, what has been approved and what has uh, been given direction on to staff at this point. So thank you very much and, and apologize. We, uh, we didn't get this in there before the CAO's presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> So thank you for that uh, presentation, Jerry. I do appreciate uh, the refresh. Once again, for council, if uh, you would like to ask any questions, please indicate that in the chat. At this point, I don't see anybody uh, with any questions for Jerry. It was uh, uh, good to have that refresh, and I hope that uh, this continues in years going forward. The next item on the agenda is the... Uh, business plan for the corporate and customer services. So John McPherson, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm John McPherson, Executive Director of Corporate and Customer Services. And I'm very pleased to be here today to present the 22-23 Budget and Business Plan for CCS. Next slide, please. Corporate and Customer Services. Our mission is customer service is at the heart of everything we do. 
We focus on providing efficient and reliable services with a focus on continuous improvement. I'll speak to the five service areas of CCS over the next couple of slides. Uh, in this photo, you'll see a recent successful collaboration. It's the recently opened Williamswood Fire Station. And it was a collaboration between our business unit departments, our stakeholders, and our clients. Next slide, please. CCS has seen a number of changes over the last year, which will be illustrated on the next two slides. Our first service is Corporate Fleet, led by Trevor Harvey. Corporate Fleet is responsible for the life cycle management of vehicles and equipment, including replacement. Capital projects include purchasing vehicles and equipment for a diverse fleet, including HRFE, HRP, municipal vehicles, and equipment. Trevor Harvey joined, uh, sorry, took on the role as director in January. Corporate real estate, led by Peter Stickings, is committed to supporting regional council priorities through real property acquisitions and disposals, industrial park development and sales, leasing and accommodations, and advisory services. And corporate real estate joined CCS back in July. Very pleased to announce environment and climate change coming to CCS effective April 1st. The team led by Shannon Miedema provides leadership in climate action and environmental sustainability. This team leads the implementation of Halifax and develops and oversees projects, policies, and programs to protect ecosystem health, reduce emissions, and adapt and prepare for the impacts of climate change. Shannon will be coming uh, to the group in the director role. Next slide, please. Facility design and construction led by Philip Deganzik. The team focuses on capital design, construction, replacement, and rehabilitation of buildings. They'll play a key role in greening our facilities. Philip I uh, came to CCS in the director role in January. Facilities, maintenance and operations led by Diane Chisholm, maintains over 240 buildings, provides preventative and life cycle maintenance planning, as well as corporate security. And finally, C, uh, customer contact centers and corporate safety, uh, effective April 1st, we'll be leaving CCS and they will be reflected in upcoming business plans. Next slide, please. The next couple of slides outline some key metrics for CCS. So first on the building side, we have a projected delivery of capital construction projects of 34.7 million. 67 capital projects delivered and two buildings built to net zero ready. And those are Fire Station 62 in Williamswood and the Fort Needham Washroom building. For corporate real estate, we have 15 million in property transaction values. For industrial lots, we've sold 85 acres resulting in a revenue of 25 million. Currently, I've increased to 450, or sorry, we currently have 450,000 square feet leases under management. For environment and climate change, since 2018, we've reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 8,530 tons. That's equivalent to removing 850 cars from the roads. This is a, reduction since 2008 of 28%, which is a good number, but there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. Next slide, please. For facility maintenance, maintain, manage 2.8 million square feet of space, projecting 12,500 work orders to be completed across those facilities. For corporate fleet, 
We maintain 1,570 assets and project a fleet repair and maintenance completion of 25,300. For community-wide emissions, which falls under the purview of environment and climate change, we've seen a 24% reduction since 2016. And as of 2021, an install capacity of renewable energy of 2,816 kilowatts. Next slide, please. The next two slides will outline uh, some of our successes. First off, corporate real estate has successfully completed the tender award of $30 million for Burnside Phase 13.1 expansion. And this represents a future development of 320 acres and a projected 300 million plus in built development value. So a major economy driver. We've completed the renovation of the Dartmouth North Library, which opened in 2021. Completed a new policy on the management of surplus properties. 120,000 square feet of accommodations premises leased, housing 650 staff. Completed two new park washroom buildings, Fort Needham and Penhorn Lake both fully accessible with universal washrooms. We've improved efficiencies through the ongoing successes of CityWorks. Next slide, please. Pleased to report that we've implemented living wage in all of our cleaning and snow removal contracts. To date, we've had 18 million in solar installations through the Solar City program. We've initiated a pilot pro project for storm kits for newcomers. Corporate fleet has begun purchasing hybrid electric vehicles, as well as electric ice resurfers, resurfacers with plans for additional ones in future years. And finally, we've completed the municipal electric vehicle strategy. Next slide. These slides will present some current and planned active initiatives for CCS. The first slide covers growth and asset renewal projects for buildings. McIntosh Depot renewal, which is illustrated in the photo to the right, a major project for us currently underway and will provide great benefits for staff and operations. Undert undertaken the renovation of Sheet Harbor Fire Station number 28. Ongoing renovations at Alderney Gate to provide a welcoming environment for visitors and businesses. Ongoing war free capitalization work for climate resiliency. Major redevelopment of the Woodside Ferry Terminal, which will be completed in the next couple of months. Design is underway for the Halifax Common Aquatic Facility, another major project for us. And design is underway for the Lakeside Community Center replacement. Next slide, please. For council priorities, inclusive communities, various accessibility projects underway. Diversity, inclusion, and accessibility pr principles are being incorporated into new designs. Ongoing accessible ramp upgrades, beach mats, and new universal washrooms. Preparations underway to meet the provincial access by design 2030. CCS has two employees now with Rick Hansen certification, two more enrolled in the program, demonstra demonstrating our commitment to accessibility. Next slide. For prosperous economy, corporate real estate is ensuring a sufficient supply of industrial lands inventory through, st through strategic outlooks. 
planned Burnside expansion phases of 13.2 and phase 14. And the integrated mobility plan land assembly requiring um, the acquisition of numerous properties to support IMP. Next slide. Under protected and sustainable envir uh, environment, environment and climate change will uh, launch their water quality monitoring program this year. And we'll continue with their watershed management programs. Next slide. Further to Halifax and reducing emissions, a number of activities underway. We have net zero standards for new construction. Under retrofit of municipal buildings, we're near completion on our net zero roadmap, which will outline our plan and resources and commitments for deep energy retrofits, providing the steps and sequencing to achieve our 2030 goal. And that document will also help inform ongoing capital requests. Ongoing recommissioning of our buildings to reduce energy and aggressively attack, uh, approaching oil conversion projects to lessen our reliance on oil. We have various financing programs, predominantly the Solar City program, uh, but also the Retrofit Renewables and Resilience R3 program. Next slide, please. For electrification of transportation, completed the municipal electric vehicle strategy. We're planning and installing electric vehicle charging infrastructure. For climate resilience, we're performing climate hazard mapping, as well as plans for building community resilience to climate impacts. Next slide, please. For the administrative priority of the exceptional customer service, some examples are the real estate service improvement initiative, as well as numerous service level agreements that are either completed or advanced between our departments and our clients. For innovative performance excellence, we're following a performance excellence strategy. We have projects underway such as light fleet optimization, continually looking at process reviews for city works and facility maintenance and operations performance management plan. Next slide, please. Healthy and safe workplace, ongoing COVID-19 cleaning requirements. We're always evaluating these requirements in keeping with current provincial health guidelines. The corporate accommodations program is focusing on improving accessibility and inclusivity in the office environment, as well as improving ergonomics, operational efficiency, and functionality. Next slide. Diverse, inclusive, and equitable environment. Diversity, inclusion, and accessibility principles are being applied to the built environment. We're seeking out and maintaining meaningful partnerships with both the public and industry. Next slide, please. This series of slides will outline some key performance indicators for CCS. This slide shows the operating cost per vehicle per kilometer for municipal equipment, demonstrates an increasing trend year over year. 
predominantly due to the increase in fuel prices and uh, the increase from inflation parts and service. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the budget tables. Next slide, please. For facility maintenance work orders, demand versus planned, see an overall downward trend, as well as a closing of the gap between demand and planned. This illustrates the benefits of our ongoing building recapitalization and leveraging our City Works program to provide more preventative maintenance programs. Next slide, please. For corporate accommodations program impact, you can see that our historic and projected office space uh, in square footage remains relatively constant. However, our total number of workspaces in, in that area is increasing. And that's a result of a strategic look at how modern workspaces are laid out. Uh, the size of individual workstations, strategic use of collaboration spaces and multifunctional spaces. Important to note that we maintain an eye on health um, concerns due to COVID and ensure that the proper spacing is in place and leverage our, our FlexWork program as well. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates our reliance on oil over time. So since 2014, we've seen a dramatic decrease in oil consumption. We've tackled some, some large building oil conversions. For example, the Eric Spicer building and Captain William Spry. Uh, we still have a number of buildings to, uh, to do, but there are plans uh, in place to, to, um, to accommodate those. Next slide, please. For corporate emissions reduction over time. Uh, so since 2008 to 2020, we've seen a, a downward trend equivalent to 28% reduction. Again, it's a good number, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Next slide, please. For community emissions, again, this falls under the purview of environment and climate change. Uh, similar to our municipal buildings, a downward trend over time. Next slide. Solar energy systems installed through the Solar City program. Uh, we've seen a, a drop from 2019 to 2020. Uh, likely due to COVID and some reduced rebates. We've seen that increase again in 2021. And we hope with uh, recent announcements that we'll continue to see an increase in that number, which is critical to success of Halifax. Next slide, please. We'll finish up with a series of uh, budget slides. This provides an overview of CCS operating budget for total expenditures and total revenue. So our total budget for 22-23 is 44.2 million. Over last year, that's an increase of 3.27 million, which I'll speak about, speak about in some following slides. Uh, some things to note are the movement of people for the reorganization, increased costs of external services, contracts, materials, and reduced revenues. Next slide, please. This table presents uh, the same data in a different format, so broken out by service area. 
Uh, you'll note a reduction in the executive director's office due to the uh, reorganization of corporate safety, who previously reported directly to the executive director. We'll see some increase for corporate real estate uh, due to reduced lease revenue, increased cost of leases, uh, some increases for facility maintenance and operations and corporate fleet. Uh, the drivers there, increased uh, inflation due to COVID, supply chain issues, increased fuel costs. And finally, environment and climate change, an increase there for some staff and consulting services to implement the actions of Halifax. Next slide, please. Staff counts, our 22-23 budget FTE is 204.8 FTEs. Associated with the reorganization, we've seen transfers 37.1. And our net change in staffing is 11.9, made up of eight from environment and climate change. We have two uh, new staff, for corporate real estate to advance the goals of IMP. We have one new staff for corporate fleet to provide green fleet services. Next slide, please. This slide provides a detailed breakdown of changes to the budget. Um, Similar to what I've, I've indicated before, uh, COVID remains an issue. Supply chain remains an issue. Access to skilled labor, increase in our contracts, as well as fuel increases. Uh, we'll take note of um, 1.267 million, which is increased cost of external services. That's made up of external uh, consulting services for Halifax, as well as our uh, internal contracts. Next slide, please. This final slide outlines some financial risks to our budget. Uh, again, COVID remains a pressure for us in terms of reduced revenue, increased expense, expenses. We're seeing ongoing inflationary risks, as well as increasing fuel price volatility. Next slide, please. So I'd like to close by thanking my colleagues and but the team and I are ready to address any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, John. Um, we very much appreciate it. Uh, for members of council, please don't forget that uh, we're using the chat to indicate if you have any questions. Um, at this point, there is nobody uh, who has indicated a question for John, but we do need someone to put the motion on the floor. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mason. Would you mind putting the motion on the floor first? Or thing, though I don't have that open right now, and I think my computer is on the verge of crashing. So if Ian could put it in the chat, I still have access to that. I'm afraid to touch anything else right now. Yeah, okay, uh, we have both put the motion in oh, the chat. To... What a team! I move that Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the corporate and customer service proposed 2022-23 budget and business plan as set out in discussion and discussed in the accompanying report dated January 26, 2022 and supporting presentation into the draft 2022-23 operating budget as a move. Second. You lose you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I zoom. I, I muted myself. Uh, thank you very much. I missed who seconded it. Was that Councillor Morris? That was Councillor Lovelace. 
Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you very much, John. Great presentation uh, from you about the work that your team is doing. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think to my colleagues on council, I'm really pleased with, and, and to Jacques, especially the decision to move uh, the climate environment unit into uh, CCS makes a lot of sense. And, and reading the uh, business case last night, uh, it became clear to me that having uh, the group that builds things, fixes things and buys vehicles also have the environment uh, if it's got to be somewhere uh, and it's not big enough to be a standalone department, this makes the most sense. So, so you can see it all through the business uh, plan, and I, I applaud that. And I, I thank you for it. Uh, this is the first year that council has been, you know, the, this is the first year where we're clearly past Halifax, having been been adopted, and where we're debating it at every single business unit. And I see a lot of really good things in here uh, in terms of uh, net zero energy ready. Uh, and all of the other pieces that you mentioned, the lower oil consumption, uh, the uh, uh, electric cars, all that stuff. But what's missing is metrics and context. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, I don't really have any amendments or, or comments beyond, you know, what, what I think council needs to see, you know, perhaps in a briefing note uh, for some of it is, um, you know how okay so we've got 22 cars last year and 20 cars this year or vice versa how many cars do we have like how, how far do we have to go because we have a hard stop in 2030 right we've committed to do these things by 2030 there's only eight fiscal years left so for all of those components of fleet and maintenance and building uh you know i i'd like to see uh both how far does it get us this year and then what I don't think is possible to do for this budget, I'm not gonna ask for it because I, I know it's not possible, yeah, but, but what we need to see by next year is, what is the rough class D estimate, rough order plan every year for the next eight years to hit that carbon bud budget by 2030? So, so uh, you know, but I think it's a really good start. I'm not, this is not a deep criticism, but I just, there's enough context there for me. Yay, we're buying electric cars. If it's only one one hundredth of the fleet and we have eight years to do it, I don't know if that's meaningful. So uh, I'd love to see a roadmap on how we're going to get to 2030 and, and to make sure that what we're seeing today is adequate. Uh, and, and I wonder if you have some comments about that and like how you see it ramping up. But I'm not asking for that for this year's fiscal uh, debates. Uh, just that that's what my eye is definitely going to be on going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, John. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, um, I agree. Health Act is a, a major undertaking and, and perspective is, is so important. I think that's, that's possibly the point you're getting to there. Um, reporting is going to be a, a big component of what, we, what we're working on this year, how to convey um, the goal as well as the results uh, to, the, uh, to the organization. Uh, and refining capital budgets is going to be an ongoing process. And uh, the current roadmaps that we're working on are going to help uh, provide that clarity. When might we see those roadmaps? Like in the coming year? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, I would expect those this coming year. Yes. That's fantastic. My other note, and I shared this with some other people from your budget, was... Um, the uh, the note that newcomer families are receiving storm kits as a part of a pilot project for them to be better prepared for extreme weather events. This is to me a classic example of HRM not doing a good job of talking about things we're doing very, very well. Like to layer that on top of the newcomer program we already have with our rec pass and with uh, transit for a year and all that stuff. I just thought that was fantastic. And, and I really applaud your team for thinking of that and putting that forward. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mason. Councillor Vago Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you for such a robust, I guess, uh, you know, report. And uh, again, synthesizing it into a, a PowerPoint is pretty amazing. One, uh, there's two questions, and maybe they don't even belong here, but they're on slide nine in the PowerPoint presentation and talks about, you know, the accessibility. And it just struck me around the, the fact that new playground, new playgrounds 
are built with accessibility in mind, but if they're replacing one, then it's not, right? So um, I'm just wondering, that probably is gonna belong in a conversation with Parks and Rec, but it just struck me when I looked at that because I saw it because it said new stuff. Um, and then my second question, and again, it may or may not belong here, but it talks, the increase in real estate uh, in that real estate line of 1 million, when I, I think I heard you say it was about an increase in leases. And so there, I do have a concern around uh, lease agreements that we have with the province that when we have to do um, uh, an assessment and our lease is based on the assessment and it's all for community good. So it's not like anybody is profiting, that kind of stuff. So uh, I think in the future, we might need to look at what those agreements with the province are on when we lease provincial land for a community under parks and rec, whether it be a playground, a baseball field, or lake access, something like that. Um, so I, I just I wonder if those that increase in leases, if we know where that usually resides, is it for our infrastructure? Is it for community benefit? Can can you just give me a little bit of information on on what those leases would be? Thank you, John. Sure, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Uh, in terms of accessibility of playgrounds, um, that's probably a, a question best directed to Parks and Rec. Uh, for buildings, we do put an accessibility layer on, uh, sorry, lens on all of our renovation retrofit projects. And we try to upgrade uh, to the extent that we can within the footprint. Uh, for leases on real estate, I uh, understand that they're generally for office accommodations. Um, so the impact on that line was both uh, increased cost of some leases and a decrease in revenues from spaces that we lease out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Mason was very much in the uh, on the wavelength that I am. I mean, I think the comment that uh, the, the big challenge in terms of on the council end of, of, of reading the report in terms of Halifax is, you know, there's a lot of good work going underway, but is, is it enough? Like where, where do we actually sit in the metric? And I mean, the, the impression I have very much from the presentation and from the report is uh, we will have a better sense of all of that this coming year because of all, all the work that is scheduled to be completed this year around mapping things out in terms of our energy program, um, in terms of the EV vehicles, um, you know, that we that some of this should should be in much, uh, much firmer frame uh, this time next year. At least I hope it will, because, you know, 2030 is uh, just around the corner. And every year that goes, we're uh, we're, we're ticking into the, that carbon budget. Uh, I'm happy to see the R3 program um, referenced here. Uh, I think like of, of all the item, items in Halifax, I mean, we can drive the change in municipal operations. A big challenge is driving the change out there in community. Um, and that R3 program where, you, where we get out there and we uh, help people do energy upgrades and efficiency stuff. I mean, to me, that's really exciting because that's one where you can, uh, you can drive that change in the community and we can actually put money back in people's pockets too, uh, fairly directly. So I, I'm very keen to see that one in there. Uh, the, the piece I just wanted to really ask about, um, since I think a lot of this was covered uh, with Councillor Mason, is regarding staffing, um, you know, and the staffing up of Halifax, um, not just here, but also throughout the organization, because we have such a short window to actually make this plan, to, 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 make, to make good effort on this plan, um, because that carbon budget, I mean, that, that, gra that visual graph with the little squares was pretty darn powerful. I mean, time is ticking. Um, so what I'm wondering about, right, we have a staffing plan for now. Um, is there, is that staffing plan kind of, is, is, is it middle of the road? Um, is there room, like if council wanted to, to scale that up even further? Because, you know, we're not going to be able to deliver the plan with non-people. But I also know that there's a point in which adding more people all at once, you get to a diminishing return because then you're spending all your time with new people and onboarding and you know there's, there's a whole process there. So I guess what I'm looking for right now is just some 
commentary as to whether or not, you know, if council were interested, whether or not there is room to do more in that area or whether what's been put forward really is, in staff's opinion, uh, the most kind of aggressive that we can be in terms of bringing new people in to work on this stuff. Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, uh, I appreciate your, your questions. Um, I think we need to probably take uh, a step or two for, uh, ahead and evaluate where we are in terms of staffing. But uh, having said that, I'll ask Shannon Miedema uh, if she'd like to add anything else to that. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon Miedema, Manager of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Uh, I think I was probably a little bit uh, ambiguous in my answer last time, uh, counselor, which is why you're maybe asking this question again. Uh, the, the truth is that everything is really changing so quickly. Um, but I, I, I agree with John that, you know, we have a, a pretty substantial ask in for increasing staffing level, levels across the organization in 22-23. We've got the reorg to sort out. We're putting some management positions in place with environment and climate change. Um, and all the business units are really ramping up. Like you, you're, you're seeing the accountability piece, you're seeing the Halifax related actions in every business plan presentation uh, this week and next week and going forward. And I think that'll give a clearer picture of where we are and uh, what we need to do. That being said, I, I certainly didn't want to give the impression that we have an, uh, all the staff that we need after the ask of 22-23. We still are definitely in a ramping up um, situation. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, John and Shannon. Um, I, so if if I if I'm interpreting this correctly, uh, we're good for this year. But certainly, I mean, this is not the. I mean, I think I think we all know that just from looking at uh, the, the, all the studies that are coming forward. I mean, this is not going to be the end of the ramping up and the ask that uh, we will. There'll be more to do next year in terms of pressure. Got some head nods there. So I yeah, think sorry, I, I that's think I'm good, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Jacques, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add to Shannon's comments and John's comments. Uh, you know, the challenge with budgeting is you do it once a year, then you manage all year round. <laughs> of course, at the end of the day, um, you know, as, as we identify uh, things that need to change in terms of resource levels, we'll be back to council. Uh, as we move forward through this and you know if, if there's a if there's an urgent need that we need to fill and we can't be see it look we just need to do this now we'll be back to you and, and, and ask for permission to, to do certain things i can have i have i have a, a fair bit of latitude in my own authority to add positions here and there when we require but you know at, at, and then i may well do that during the year but you know, obviously i'll be looking to shannon and john to come back to me with advice and uh, and, the, and the rationale for that but ultimately you can be sure that uh we all get the issue of Halifax. It's the most important thing we're going to do in the last 10 years. So we got to get this done and uh, it will be done. I can tell you. Uh, thank you for that, Jacques. I really appreciate it, especially about uh, the potential for in year as we identify and work through this. It's, you know, it's hard to fit this, I think, into a conventional uh, uh, budget sort of um, setup. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, do you have anything further to add? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for this presentation. Um, John, it's uh, it's great to have you uh, kind of give us this overview and uh, position us, <laughs> you know, to, to uh, move forward. I, I, I understand, um, you know, switching out the customer contact centers to finance and asset. I'm trying to get an understanding for uh, the justification for that seems to me it used to be there and now it's it's moved back over I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know what are what are we what are we accomplishing with that um because I'm, I'm not quite clear on uh on the reasoning so just if you could walk me through that um the other thing uh that I just want to um sort of piggyback on what uh Councillor Austin said I, I I completely agree I think when we're looking at 
you know, uh, ramping up and, and staffing up, there really is a specific formula that we have to be careful uh, that we recognize capacity building just doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, and it, we are about to deliver uh, the next regional plan through this review process. And then we're going to kick into gear very quickly uh, into that 2031, uh, you know, municipal planning strategy. So, you know, it's, it's, we're, 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 we're jumping ahead very quickly in order to realize, uh, you know, the, the, our climate action plan with Halifax and ensuring that uh, all of those objectives uh, and goals are realized and embedded within the business units. And so while uh, my question um, uh, to uh, the CAO, uh, at a, I think it was at Cal, uh, around, well, why are we taking this 3% out uh, and having a separate line item uh, on the tax bill when we're actually embedding this work? And, and the response was, well, that's because it's time limited. So my question then uh, to, to you, Jacques, or uh, to Shannon, is if it's time limited, what's our ex exit strategy? Because you know, e even though uh, we, we've got a very specific plan with Halifax, um, it's not like we're just going to then pull out all of this uh, climate action work that we're doing uh, that's been embedded within the business units. So I'm just trying to understand as we're scaling up, um, is there a plan to scale down as things are getting done? What What's the bigger uh, view on this if we're suggesting that that 3% uh, climate action tax is time limited? Uh, so I'd appreciate um, just answers to those two questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the question through you, Mr. Chair, to the Deputy Mayor. So, <clears throat> you know, Council has adopted Halifax and it's a major piece of policy. We've gone from policy development and policy adoption to policy implementation now. And uh, we have uh, basically eight, nine years to get this done, right? So we're, we're into eight, year eight. Uh, and we have and we have specific targets to hit by 2030. Uh, once 2030 hits, we believe that our fleet will be greened, and uh, whether it's buses and any other any other and small fleet and other other things, our buildings will be retrofitted and uh, and you know brought to net zero values at some level, and um, and you know the intention is to complete that plan. So the monies that are set aside for Halifax, the 3%, and I will repeat again, uh, I mentioned to you uh, last time we talked in Cal and also privately that, you know, the, the, the monies that we're setting aside in the strategic reserve are, are intended to fund the principal interest payments on the, on the debt that we're going, to, uh, we're going to incur associated with implementing Halifax and some other, other measures. So, at the end of the day, uh, that's why we've segregated it out. I also will repeat again that the decision to have a separate tax is not is the advice we're giving council. It's a council decision whether or not you accept that advice. Council decides they want to want to they do not want to have a separate tax on that. Uh, then obviously uh, it will just be incorporated into into whatever increase council approves at the end of the day. So the extra strategy per se is. You know, by the time 2030, 31 rolls around, we will have completed the work that we anticipate uh, doing in, in the, uh, in, in, uh, as a result of implementing Halifax. And at that point going forward, you know, the work that we're going to do in terms of climate change will be ongoing work. It'll be, you know, at that point, we'll have to start replacing electric buses, perhaps, or we'll have to start changing out various, um, systems that are that are involved in our buildings i mean i you know i can't comment specifically on life cycle at this point of the various various elements but you can appreciate in the next in the decade in the 2030 decade we'll be looking at life cycle and repairs and that'll be just basically built into the uh, the budgets that exist that are adopted by council at that time right to to, to maintain the infrastructure that we've actually built in this decade going forward uh, in the in the early years of 2030, well, our life cycle costs will be less. But as we progress through the decade, life cycle costs will obviously increase as we move forward through the through the piece. So, in our view, there's there well, based on what we know today, we don't believe that there is going to be a requirement for uh, a, a additional or an extension of the three percent uh, piece. Now, you know, it's a bit of a mug's game to try to predict what's going to happen 10 years from now or 15 years from now or 20 years from now. Things may change. 
But based on what we know today, based on the plan that council endorsed, that's the plan. Like again, the exit strategy is based on the fact that we're going to be moving out of implementation into maintenance, and you know the, uh, the tax would be dropped off at that point. Um, you know, and uh, but you know maybe that, that council member they may have a different view of that and have different have a different set of challenges. I don't know, but uh, that's that's sort of the answer to the question. I don't know, John, you want to add to that? I think that that covers it very well. Uh, I'll add to the uh, question on customer contact centers and the justification to move that over to finance and asset management. Um, customer contact centers and uh, finance asset management already work closely on the tax revenue side of things in terms of tax payments. Uh, we looked at a, a smoothing of um, uh, of the of the uh, business units, and uh, that was the that was the driver for the move. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that and uh, understand the the coming transition in future budgets. So so thank you for that, uh, Jacques, and, and thanks, John. John, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is now uh, just after twelve o'clock. Uh, the next speaker is the mayor. So. Um, I'm just looking out to council at this point. Would you like to uh, go ahead, Jacques? Sorry, Mr. Chair. It's all good. Uh, Jerry was just texting me that, you know, after, if we get customer, corporate customer services done uh, relatively early this afternoon, next up is uh, the Auditor General. That typically doesn't take a long time. But Jerry's volunteered to bring, to have this presentation on finance and asset management if council would. Would would uh, would want to do that to save more time, recognizing however that maybe some folks have not actually had the chance to read that business plan. But, but Jerry's putting up his hand, saying, "You know, I'm more than happy to present this afternoon if council so wishes." Okay, I appreciate uh, I appreciate that offer. Uh, if council uh, uh, could reach out by email and let uh, Jerry, Jock, and myself know uh, if you would like to see that uh, today or not. Uh, the default is to uh, wait for it on Friday, um, but uh, we can certainly do that today um, if if everybody is okay with it. If people aren't okay with it, then we'll hold it off till Friday. Um, and we have had two comments at this point uh, that are indicating that uh, Friday is better. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and I guess all of council, would you like to continue at this point or uh, would you like to take an hour and come back at 1 p.m.? Lunch. Go yeah. Let's go for lunch. Keep going and finish it. Well, there we, you go. What do I know? We do have three speakers left um, and I have had uh, four votes for lunch and five votes for lunch. Let's take a break. Let's resume at 1 p.m. And uh, Mr. Mayor, you would be the first speaker. The lunch Thank, you is very Thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon. We will now be muting microphones and cameras and pulling up a holding slide. We will return at one o'clock. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. It is now one o'clock. We'll be taking down the holding screen and returning microphones and cameras. We are streaming to YouTube, Chair Russell. You can call the meeting back to order as soon as you are ready. Thank you very much, Ian. I would ask my colleagues to uh, either type something in the chat or turn your camera on so that we know that you're back. I would want to make sure that we're proceeding with the majority here. And at this point, I've seen 10 out of 17. And while that is a simple majority, I prefer to wait for just a minute or two. I'm not a majority of simple. Some days. <laughs> Some days we are. Uh, We have a note uh, over for the uh, for the clerk. We have a note in the chat that uh, the video feed may have stopped. Um, I haven't checked it. I assume it is still going. We seem to have enough uh, councillors back now. Let uh, let's resume. We are in the middle of the uh, corporate and customer services discussion. I'm going to repost my list of speakers in the chat. And Mr. Mayor, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues and staff, uh, John and team. You know, corporate and customer services um, probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. For me, it really came into focus. Um, and I expect Councillor Blackburn might agree with this. She was deputy mayor at the time. But when, when COVID hit and we were all in that crazy time and we had these calls every morning at 8.30 that uh, we joined into, you saw just how important this department was. At the time, Jerry uh, led the department. John was very much part of it. Uh, but like everything that happened for COVID, emergency or routine, CCS seemed to be involved in, uh, in it. And uh, it, does, it does a tremendous amount of, of important work. So um, uh, thank you, John, for the, for the presentation here. Um, just a couple of, the first thing I want to say, it really has nothing to do with your presentation, but it's on the, uh, modular housing that uh, opened up in Dartmouth and will open up in Halifax that a lot of great people in the city did work on that. One of the things we heard, I saw John took me on a couple of tours. One of the things that we heard from our service provider partners was John, the great work that you and your team uh, had done on that. So that's the kind of thing that this department does quite often and uh, in an unheralded way. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I was pleased to see John that, um, while we may have more employees, we're, we're, we're not hiring, we're not, we're not uh, leasing more space, which seems to mirror the trend in the private sector where companies are moving from one office to another and taking less space. And people are having less office or smaller offices. I'm glad we're doing that. And that makes sense uh, to me. I appreciate that. Glad to see that we have people doing the Rick Hansen certification. I think it said there was two that have completed, two more that are doing it. John, is, can you just talk a little bit about that and the issue of, of the accessibility of the projects that we're working on and how important that is? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the mayor. Um, start off with the uh, comments on the Rick Hansen certification. So um, that's going to help our staff uh, put a, a lens on accessibility through our projects. Um, it's a lot more than having people be able to enter a building and um, you know, go to the washrooms. It's, it's about all the amenities in the building. So it's, uh, it's a lot more holistic and excited to see, um, see those learnings uh, get applied on our future projects. All right, thank you. I encourage that. I hope many more, more go through that process. I noticed uh, in the budget, external services was up quite dramatically. And um, 
in your presentation, you uh, spoke to it. I think it was, I can't see it now, but 1.75 million in contract. A lot of people don't like that. I do. I like to see us using external services. It means we pay for exactly what we want. To the deputy mayor's point before about, um, you know, when do we start to uh, sort of come down from some of these expenses related to um, things like Halifax. I think it's really important for two reasons. One, we pay for what we want, but number two, we support local business. So can you just chat a little bit about what's included in that? What kind of external services will be will be uh, engaging? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the mayor. Uh, external services really covers uh, a number of different things across our departments um, for um, facility maintenance and operations, for example, it's, it's hiring uh, contractors for repairs. Um, it's uh, all of our cleaning, snow clearing contracts uh, for which we've instituted the, uh, the living wage. Um, there's uh, consultants for uh, Halifax and environment and climate change. Uh, so it really does cover uh, a lot of different work where we go outside um, our organization for expertise or for uh, additional support. Okay. You say snow clearing. That's not part of your budget, is it? Uh, snow clearing for parking lots. Parking lots. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Quick question. Halifax Common Pool. Are we on target for that? Uh, we've awarded the uh, design build RFP. Uh, so we have a, a builder and a designer on board. Design work is on, ongoing. Um, and our target completion is for the aquatic season of 2023. Right. And we're on target for it. We, we, you're speaking with absolute assurance that we'll get that. We're going. That's an important piece to get done. I know it's an expensive piece, but um, I'm certainly hoping that we're not going to miss any more of, a, of, a, of an outdoor season, for the, particularly for the kids who use that. And also, like Councillor Mason, delighted to see uh, Shannon and her department uh, in here. I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much, uh, John. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was kind of waffling back and forth whether I need to actually speak or not on this, but I, I don't know if we have to explain our vote here, but I, I am not going to be able to vote yes for this budget only because this is where the 3% climate action tax is going to be housed. And it's not against <laughs> Shannon. I, I have no, no doubt in my mind that you're the absolute best person to take this municipality from here to there. Absolutely. Starting to gain an appreciation of why this is necessary and like the, the impact to our, uh, to our city um, and why. So that's very helpful. I am still fundamentally opposed to charging our homeowners and our small businesses um, this property and commercial tax of 3%. I feel like it is premature. Um, our, our speaker, who uh, was the public pres presenter this morning, uh, the economist who suggested, you know, collaborating with the provincial government uh, to see if we could tag on a you know, a gas tax uh, here in HRM to, to fund towards this. Yes, like why are, and maybe this was considered by staff, but if it hasn't, it, it needs to be. Like uh, my no vote is not against the the department. It's, it's against the tax of 3%. At this time, um, it, it almost feels tone deaf to me after the, the psychological, the economic, the physiological challenges and sometimes devastations that our small businesses and low income homeowners have, have come through these past two years. And in the climate of prices of just about every single thing escalating at an unprecedented scale. So um, I hate being the negative Nelly, I, but th th this is my conviction and uh, I want to see us succeed in these Halifax big, huge plans. I don't want us to put the load of burden on our homeowners and small businesses as much as possible. We should not leave any stone left unturned looking for collaborations and funding sources outside of our homeowners and small businesses. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. I'm not sure if there is anything there that, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, to kind of follow up on what Trish was saying, I, I mean, I, there is um, a lot of questions around the 3%. And in particular, um, my questions are, where will this 3% fund sit? Um, will it be a new revenue stream on our on our balance sheets? Will it be um, like how will it be accounted for? Where will it sit? And more importantly, how is it going to be allocated? So you know we we have this tax. How do we know where the three percent is actually going to be invested and spent in helping us reach the Halifax goals? And um, will there be an itemized uh, list or, you know, some way of um, us, us understanding better um, how, it, how it's going to be spent? I see that uh, Jerry has popped up um, and Bruce. Uh, so Jerry, would you like to kick it off, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Jerry Blackwood, CFO. Um, yeah, I can, I can take it first. And if, if there's anything I miss, uh, Bruce can certainly jump in. So the 3% is uh, basically how it's going to be accounted for is, 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 uh, is uh, we raise the money through the tax and the revenue is allocated to the strategic initiatives reserve. So as we spoke about and, and brought the council <clears throat> uh, through the fiscal framework, um, the money that we raise through this tax will sit in the reserve and as we complete the projects and issue debt, the, the money will, will go against uh, debt and uh, interest payments uh, for those projects. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the spend and the reporting and, and, and stuff around that, I think, uh, um, I don't know if Shannon's on the call, but I think there's a pretty robust uh, sort of reporting uh, process with the Halifax program that there will be uh, an annual progress report uh, that will keep uh, council updated uh, on uh, on spending, and certainly through our quarterly reporting and, and year-end financial reporting through audit and finance, uh, we'll bring back a uh, you know we report on our reserve positions there. So uh, I don't know if that covers it all. If if there's anything Bruce would like to add, uh, he could, he could yeah, no, that's pretty good, Jerry. The only thing I'd add is that there's a. Uh, Council passed the schedule of multi-year projects on uh, on Friday, and that included the 119.6 million for Halifax projects and the uh, EV buses. So those are the specific projects that will be uh, paid for out of the reserve. Yeah. So I, I think I think we need some better understanding around this. I mean, if we're going to improve, uh, approve a new tax on the tax bill of 3%, um, you know, a better understanding of, of where that money is actually going and what the business plan is for that money for the next year, um, for the next fiscal year. Um, you know, the, the EV buses is, is one piece, but, you know, what about the rest? And to Councillor Lovelace's points earlier, when we look at embracing Halifax as a strategic plan and embedding it within all of our bus business units and, um, and deliverables, um, how do we differentiate between work that is being done, let's say an industrial park that, you know, we're going to look at that through a green lens, um, you know, work that has to be done anyway. How, you know, where would the, the Halifax tax, the, the climate change tax kind of be applied to that? Um, I'm, I'm just not really understanding quite yet how that money is going to be spent, how it integrates with the business units and their business plans and the accountability we're asking for within each, each business unit to be working toward advancing the Halifax goals. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, would you like to respond to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. Um, there's very specific chunks of projects that were put in as strategic initiatives on the capital side that led to the uh, recommendation of the 3%, um, not the operating money that we're talking about in the business plan here, but on the capital project side. So aside from the buses and the electrification of our transit system, it's the decarbonization of our corporate buildings. It's doing the full electric vehicle strategy and it's looking at our critical infrastructure 
from an adaptation perspective and building in protections and resilience of the critical infrastructure that we own and maintain in the city. Those are the three very discrete projects that we have estimated costs for out um, 10 years in the capital plan. And that is the information that finance used to suggest the 3%. And if I'm wrong in any of that, please, please correct me, but that's my understanding. No, you're yeah. correct. Yeah, if, if if I could just just add there, it's uh, you know as Bruce said, in a, in a nutshell, the the capital component of of the three percent essentially boils down to uh, electric buses and the Halifax actions, which are focused on you know uh, building retrofits, um, uh, uh, electric vehicles for our corporate critical infrastructure and some other smaller bundled uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cuddle, does that address the first set? You were over time, so I would ask you to come back if there is more. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, it, I was, uh, have to admit, uh, completely dumbfounded by Councillor Purdy's last statement. Um, but, you know, then I, I thought better of it. Um, and I would like to second Councillor Purdy's motion to commission a study uh, to look at the benefits of sending a fellowship in search of a magical funding tax fair unicorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um. I'm not sure how to respond to that, uh, Councillor Cleary. I, I appreciate. Um, it's Groundhog Day. There we go. Uh, thank you, Councillor Morris. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not sure who to direct my question to, but I'm looking for a brief explanation for why uh, we have decided or rec the staff are recommending that we have a 3% tax appear on the um, on people's tax bills and what what the pros and cons are of that as far as staff are concerned and my understanding is it's optional at, um, and we could we could change uh, that mm -hmm. if we decide to um, and I, I guess what my concern is that it it uh, when you have that flagged um, it, it uh, sends a different message than I think is a positive message. I think it sends a negative message. If we, if we put our um, roads maintenance, for example, as a separate item on the tax bill, I think that would, that would um, make people upset. Uh, if we put our library or our fire service as a separate item on the tax bill, um, I, I, I think it, it just doesn't send the right message when we've all agreed that Halifax is something we need to do for the municipality. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Uh, would uh, Jerry, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. so you know, good points, and and I think you know it's been brought up uh, by Councillor uh, Lovelace and and uh, Councillor Cuddle. Um, I think the CAO spoke well to this. It's it's optional. Um, in terms of rationale and bringing this forward, um, you know, with respect to. Fire police, you know, they're general, you know, municipal services that have been around for, you know, a while. I guess when you look at, you know, um, funding Halifax, we we heard from council loud, loud and clear, bring back a budget with a funding plan uh, for Halifax, which we did. Uh, you know, we're recommending the three percent climate action tax, and and you know, when you look at uh, Halifax, it's it's a bold strategy. It's uh, something, uh, you know, where we're investing in, in climate change. It's bold, it's strategic. Uh, you know, we put, put this to uh, council for, for decision in terms of it, it's transparent. People see that uh, how uh, the council, the city is being bold and we are investing in, in climate change. But, it is optional. It can certainly be rolled up into the uh, the general rate, and that is uh, council's uh, uh, prerogative if they if they choose to do that. Okay. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Councillor Othet. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And sort of following along with Councillor Cuddle and Councillor Morse, I'm, uh, I've got mixed feelings about the, the, the separate tax, except I, I like the idea that it really emphasizes to people that A, we're taking this seriously, and B, that it has a specific use. So then my question might be to Jacques or to Jerry, if we have the specific tax for the specific purposes that have been outlined, we put it into a strategic reserve, what happens a year or two from now or a subsequent council has access to that strategic reserve but decides to do something that doesn't involve electrification of, of buses or preparing for sea rise, uh, uh, greening of buildings, you know, this, this sort of thing. So, you know, suddenly the police station falls down and we need a new one and we can't afford it. Uh, suddenly the art gallery is underwater and they need money to, well, we got that could arguably be greening, I guess. But what is to keep, if, if, if it's going to be a separate charge for a separate purpose, should it not also be in a separate reserve with some pretty hard to change rules around how it is to be used down the road because in theory you know how many times a week do we hear well that's the will of council if council wants to do this you know council is supreme they can do this that and the other thing so we pay into this fund for three years let's say four years and down the road now suddenly you know the police station does come up or another issue comes up a road uh, collapses or needs to be built so what sort of parameters can we put around with the, with the collection of this tax if it's specific and then the use of it to keep it specific. Is that, if that makes sense, Jerry, does that help? Yeah, I think so. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll ask, ask Bruce to, uh, to jump in here as well. Um, so with any, any, uh, <clears throat> sorry, any reserve fund that we have, uh, including the strategic initiative reserve, uh, mm -hmm. council approves a business case yep. for that reserve. So that outlines basically what the fund can be used for okay. in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of capital projects, for example, or if it's an if it's an operating uh, reserve, what certain one time expenditures can can, uh, you know, be put against that. So, you know, for an example, if, um, you know, uh, a nonprofit group came forward and we're looking for a million dollars for a new facility. The strategic initiative reserve, uh, you know, wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't apply in that case, right? So it all comes down to to the business case. So uh, I'll ask Bruce to get into if he could just maybe outline a little bit of the the cold notes around the business case for the strategic uh, initiative reserve. Thanks. Well, the the strategic initiative reserve has to be for those projects that council has deemed to be strategic initiatives. Uh, and so I know that there is a judgment call there in council and, and we can't bind future councils in terms of their interpretation of what that is or may not be or from changing the business case. However, you have approved the Halifax capital projects as multi-year projects. And so those will be committed in the reserve. So uh, I think it would be incumbent on staff to come back and say, well, you're actually using money that you've committed against the Halifax projects and for climate change. And if council wishes to send that money elsewhere, then it has to take the authority away from the Halifax projects. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there are any tools we have that would prevent council from changing its mind or eventually reversing its decisions. Uh, but, uh, but the tools that we can use are all in place. Yeah, thank and, and thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, guys. That, and I don't know, I'm still wrestling in my mind between breaking out the 3% or not, but I, and that's fine. We've got lots of time to talk about that, think about that. But I, I just want, for those listening and also counsel, there is some risk in theory that down the road, you know, the pool, the fire station, the police station, whatever, some road, something comes up that could in fact, by subsequent counselor, councils be deemed to be a strategic enough to dip into this reserve. I just don't, and I don't know that there's a way around it, Bruce. I don't know if we can come up with some, maybe John Traves could, if there's something we could, you know, come up with such restrictions around this 
reserve that it would take, you know, a pretty good reason and two thirds vote to council, you know, whatever. But I just hate to see setting the expectations to the public with this special reserve, with the special tax and to have it not used for those purposes. Maybe others don't agree with that, but I just wanted to ask this publicly and uh, appreciate the answers. Uh, thank you, Councillor Othit. Um, go ahead, Jacques. <clears throat> I don't have much more to offer other than say that, you know, as other projects come up, then the source of funding has to be established for that, right? And, you know, we've been advised to. So, you know, like a police station, for example, I mean, you know, we're going to have to take on, likely have to take on additional debt to make something like that happen uh, outside of this uh, conversation. I mean, we're, we're you know, we have basically forecasted what our debt's going to be over the next 10 years, and, and we have the four year fiscal framework in which we're a little more precise on that. But as things change, things, you know, think council councils in full control of this. You know, the rules of order was still apply, the AOs will still apply. So, you know, typically if you council makes a decision and then there's a, motive, a, a, a notice of rescission or, you know, to, to change that decision, then of course the rules do apply, right? So uh, in terms of the number of votes and percentage of votes and those kinds of things. So, you know, there's no, there's no way that you can lock it in uh, under, under the current framework uh, with, with any, in, in any absolute terms, as council has to follow its own rules in terms of voting and what percentage is two thirds or whatever it is. Uh, but the, there's no other way to do it. Uh, unless you know we went to the province and asked them to you know make make do something, but uh, that's sort of where it is. Okay, no, that's what I expected. Thanks, gents. Thanks, chair. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, oh, when I put my name in the chat, uh, I had something else in mind, and then this conversation has happened, and now I'm in a little bit of a different spot. Um, but that's the beauty of, uh, you know, many minds thinking together, I guess. Um, the mayor did uh, ask about the external services, uh, which was one of my questions. I guess I want to know in terms of process, whether the 3% is separated out or not. <clears throat> is that a decision that needs to be made today? Or is that a decision that happens, I would think, later on when we're getting down there? So in preparation for that and following up on Councillor Morse's point, um, about the pros and cons, so changing that up, just what is the risk and what is the benefit of having it separated out? If we could maybe have a briefing note um, on the risk or benefit of having the 3% separated as a climate tax, um, if we could entertain that, because I was of the mind that I would like to see it separated out. I think it is a, a new initiative, it's a, it's a big deal. If it comes, it's the first one in Canada, I think we've been hearing about. So being able to track it, being able to see where the income's in and, uh, and what we've spent it on, because according to the strategic uh, initiatives reserve, it's on capital. So yeah, so I, I'm just wondering if we might have a briefing note on what the pros and cons are, because uh, you know our staff did a great job, I'm sure, of coming up with the recommendation and the reasons why. So maybe there's more that could come out in a briefing note. My only other last quick comment was, when we look at the report and it says the financial risks, 37 staff changes, people leaving, people moving, all of that kind of stuff, it is a lot. And I just wonder if maybe we might be able to put one comment there about what is the, what is the, the HR pressure that comes with a lot of these changes in departments. And uh, so yeah, so just, we really value our staff. And uh, that's a lot of change. And so just being able to see what is what is the pressure and the risk on our staff when you have that many changes in in a business unit. So that's my that's my uh, thought at the moment. Okay, before we go there, before we go too far down that road, I'm wondering, Councillor Daigle Gammon, if uh, if you would like to make a motion to get that briefing note. I would no, love to I, make that motion, I, Mr. Chair. I'll second that, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Opa. And I, I see that uh, Jacques has his hand up. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to answer her, uh, Councillor Daigle Gamma's question. So I don't know if you want to put this to a vote first. Would a, would uh, the information that you provide uh, potentially mean that a vote wasn't needed? Well, all I'll say is that we're happy to provide a briefing that we don't need a motion. Uh, so, but if you want to have a motion, that's fine too. Yeah. 
My, my preference would be for uh, for a motion to keep uh, all of the briefing notes in, in line with that. So, uh, and uh, Ian and I have been in touch about that earlier today as well. So, if there are no further comments on the briefing note that uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon has requested, question. the question, question has been called. Ian? Is there a motion uh, that can be put in chat so we can we can see it? Thank you. Awesome. So the motion that Ian has put in the chat uh, that that the clerk's office has put in the chat rather is that the budget committee request the chief administrative officer provide a briefing note on the rationale of separating out the Halifax budget line within tax notices, including pros and cons to this approach. May, may I just suggest a small edit instead of pros and cons, the risk and benefit. The risks and benefits to this approach. It is your motion. Risks or benefits, yeah. Risks. I still second it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Beginning with District 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. Four, the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Sure. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. Yes. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Chair Russell. In favor. <clears throat> 16, Councillor Outhead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion. One, Councilor Daigle Gallon. Voting in favor of the motion. And two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Thank you. Thank you very much. That motion passes. We will be uh, receiving that briefing note. I don't have any further speakers on my list. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jacques. <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, Councillor Diego Gammon was was asking what the, what about the pressures around staffing. I think that's been an unanswered question. I believe. Yes, so, thank you. You know, within this within this particular business unit, so there's been a number of changes, right? We brought in, we're bringing in the entire environmental team, and we're moving out three one one. This is all about in you know executive um, sponsor, executive director capacity, and putting focus where it needs to be put. So when I think about climate change and, and our, our some of the work we, we are undertaking and will undertake, um, you know, Mayor's point, we have put this group in with the folks that are actually gonna do things, right, on buildings and fleet. That's where it resides. And that's why it makes sense. I think Councillor uh, Mason made this point as well. So that's where it resides and that's why we are putting it there. And that's, you know, so it's, not so much a pressure, but a reorganization that we, that we need to bring uh, bring the people in that'll be that'll work best together. The same um, the same applies uh, when we look at uh, corporate safety. Uh, corporate safety is about our people, and we've moved the corporate safety folks into uh, HR under Laura Nolan's uh, leadership. And uh, you'll recall that you know we we moved ICT from what was previously known as uh, HR, uh, ICT, and uh, corporate communications. Uh, we moved that function under support directly to Caroline Blair-Smith, who's the, direct, uh, who's the uh, deputy CEO in relation to corporate. 
So that's that was a strategic move to make sure that we, we the people, the executive sponsors of these various functions, have the capacity to do it. And then lastly, we you know when we look at when we look at housing and and all the all the pressure that we face, and this is a pressure. Um, uh, on the pressure we face with in terms of delivering on building permits and planning approvals and subdivision permit subdivision approvals and all of that, uh, and the work that Kelly is doing on the provincial task force, um, you know, that's, that's chaired that's chaired by Jeff McClellan at the moment, along with Peter and Peter uh, Duncan, who's our who's our tra- who's our you know d- d- planning and development transportation side uh, expert and leader. We want to make sure that they're focused on that work. The planning and development work, not just the provincial task force, but all of this stuff that we're doing in terms of, you know, we have we're we're in a major expansion mode here. You know, real, you know, we're issuing we issued four thousand six hundred building permits uh, last year, and uh, that number is going to grow uh, for sure, given all the uh, changes that, that Kelly is, is introducing into the planning processes of trying to streamline and fast track approvals in, in various categories, whether it's subdivision approvals, whether it's building permits, whether it's development agreements, whether it's zoning changes and all that. So a real focus on that. So that's why we really took the environment out and in, in, in to make sure it was had, had the focus uh, that, it, that it required, while at the same time preserving the focus that we need uh, to, to, uh, to have on the, on the planning and development side of the shop, right? And then 311 moved over to Jerry Blackwood, which who, uh, who sort of offered to take on that role. He was very familiar with 311 before, uh, had that as part of his business unit. And, uh, and there's a, you know, we believe there's a strong fit there and Jerry has the capacity to lead that, uh, lead that team as well. So that's sort of the rationale for it all. And I see Caroline has her hand up as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Caroline. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just to add a a small bit to what Jacques has uh, done a great job of explaining. Um, I just wanted to provide some clarity. The 37 FTEs being transferred out is um, part of what Jacques has just described as transfers around the organization. So not being transferred out of the organization. And you will see on Friday in the HR presentation that the turnover rate in HRM is extremely low. In fact, you'll see it on the success slide. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we're able to retain employees in such a hot labor market. So just wanted to add a bit of clarity to that. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I don't see any further speakers. Uh, we have the main motion on the floor. Would uh, somebody like to call the question? Question has been called. Yeah. Beginning with District 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting no. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. One of the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Yes. And Councillor Morris. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Outhead. Vote. <clears throat> Excuse me, voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. 1, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. And three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Thank you. Thank you very much. That motion passes. Uh, Thank you to uh, uh, John and his team. Next, we are on the Office of the Auditor General. Evangeline is with us. Uh, you have a presentation, so go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to be here to share my proposed budget for 2022-23. If the clerk's office, thank you very much, could start sharing my slides, that would be great. You can move to the next slide, please. Okay. 
Okay, I'm still seeing the original slide. Can you, yeah, thank you very much. So I'll just start with a little bit of information about my office. Um, as I'm sure you all know, it is an independent office and we have a bit of a different budget process as a result. We provide our numbers to finance so that they have all the information that they need to prepare the overall HRM budget, but the CFO and the CAO um, are not involved in the approval process for my budget. It comes directly here um, to this committee. And there's just a little bit of information here on the mission, vision, and values of the Office of the Auditor General. Next slide, please. I'll provide you with a brief overview of the past year. We are forecasting to be under budget at year end. Four of the five audits we had planned for 22, sorry, 2021 22 are underway. Um, management of solid waste operations. The audit is complete, and you will see the report from that in a couple of weeks um, later in February. We are currently working on an audit that originally was, was uh, titled in my audit plan for the year, Managing Workplace Behavior Complaints. Um, ultimately, during planning, that title was changed to Respectful Workplaces. We're wrapping up field work on that now, and I expect it will be reported uh, in late spring. We are also working on a Halifax Water IT audit. Field work is just getting underway on that and planning is underway on a real estate audit. There was also a fifth audit, HRM IT, that was planned for 21-22. Um, I expect that that will carry over into 22-23. I don't think we will get it started before the end of March. I will have an annual report on 21-22, as well as my audit plans for 22-23 uh, over the next couple of months. You can expect me to release that and, and to share it with you in April. Our staffing complement as of late January 22, we do have two vacant positions um, in the office. One's been vacant since a retirement over the summer, and the other one's a new vacancy as of February. I do plan to fill both of those um, in the coming months, hopefully around the start of the year or shortly thereafter of the new fiscal year. I've released three audit reports to date in 21-22, management of accounts payable, transit technology project management, management of the fire inspection program. And I've also released a follow-up report that looked at three audits from 2019. Follow-up is an important part of our work. It's how we provide assurance to council, whether management is fixing issues that have been identified as a result of audits. Um, you likely are all aware, we follow up roughly 18 months after an audit ends. We do try to group two or three audits together. So sometimes it is a little more than 18 months. Uh, this fiscal year so far, we've followed up and released payroll management, the purchasing card program, and road and sidewalk asset management. 63% of the recommendations from those three audits, or 17 of 27 RECs, were implemented. The rate is down from prior follow-up work. Um, we understand from management that COVID uh, has had an impact on their timelines and ability to fix issues that have been identified by audits. So we will continue to follow up after 18 months going forward, and we'll look for that percentage completion to trend upwards once again. You will also get a new follow-up report on, I believe it's three more audits uh, in a few weeks. Next slide, please. So this slide is just our overall FTE count. It was at 9.6 uh, in the year we're in now, and I expect it will be at 9.6 again in 22-23. As mentioned, we do have a couple of vacancies and we do plan to fill those. Next slide, please. So the Office of the Auditor General's budget is really mostly salaries. My 2000, sorry, 2022, I cannot say those years properly, 2022-23 budget request is 64,100 or 5.3% 5 less than my 21-22 request. Um, there's a couple of things behind that. The 21-22 budget request included 71,000 for IT audit expertise. That was a, a one-time item. 
22-23 includes 35,000 to cover any potential external expertise outside my office that I might need for specific audits that we'll undertake in that fiscal year. So the 71-1 was really a one-time item and I didn't expect that to be an annual amount. Our salary budget is all, also uh, on almost 19,000 less. We had one staff member who retired and one who recently left the office. So both of those positions will be replaced at either an auditor or lead auditor level in my office. And that's included in the 22-23 budget request. Um, I'm going to be redistributing certain office responsibilities. That will allow us to have one more field staff member than we have had previously once those two vacancies have been filled. And that will increase our audit hours on an annual basis somewhat. There's a few other miscellaneous reductions that total around $10,000. Next slide, please. This is just an overview of the changes from the prior year that I went through on the previous slide. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. Um, if the clerk's office uh, can stop sharing the presentation now, that would be great. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Evangeline. Um, so the floor is open to questions at this point. I don't see uh, that anybody has put their name in the chat to ask any questions. I would ask any councillors uh, to do that. And so Councillor Dago Gammon, thank you very much. Would you be able to put the motion on the floor? Yes, I would, Mr. Chair. I would move that the budget committee direct staff to incorporate the Office of the Auditor General's proposed 2022-23 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the January 26th, 2022 staff report and supporting presentation into the draft 2022-23 operating budget. Second, second. Tim, I'll call for That's the it. question too. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Othit for seconding that. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Dago Gammon. I, I don't think it's gonna be very often that we're gonna look at a, a business unit or a program and see a reduction. So uh, yes, Councillor Othit, call for the question. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. We do have another question. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I also thank the Office of the Auditor General. This is not an easy report. So thank you very much, Vandalay. I just, I just wanted to know um, a little bit more about the released audits. I believe there was an audit on the community monitoring committee and is, that's not part of your list. Is there a particular reason for that not being there? Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, we did not do an audit of the community monitoring committee. We did an audit of management of solid waste. So okay. we were looking at um, HRM's management of mostly solid waste contracts. And that is the audit that I mentioned that will be released in a couple of weeks. However, we did not, as part of that, specifically audit the Community Monitoring Committee. Okay, thank you, I misunderstood. When will the, you said the follow-up of the management of solid waste will be coming in a few months? No, the results of the audit will be coming uh, in February. And so we follow up 18 months later. So. 18 months from that would be what uh, later in 2023 is when you could, that's when we would start the follow up. So we would reach out to, to the department at that time to follow up any recommendations. It's usually a couple of months beyond that point when we report the results. So it could very well be early 2024. Great. Thank you for the conf uh, confirmation and uh, I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see no further uh, questions in the chat. So would somebody like to call the question? I'll call it again. Ah, oh, super. Thank you, Councillor Othit. Uh, Ian. Beginning with District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mantini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. 
In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. Yes. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Deputy Mary Lovelace. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Outhit. I think I can support this, yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councilor David Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. And four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That motion passes. That concludes our business today. Uh, if uh, we could have a motion to adjourn and then we will see everybody on Friday morning at 9.30. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Would somebody like to adjourn? Motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. Thank you very much, Councillor.